good to see everyone. Uh, I now convene the October 8, 9, 2020 meeting of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. Will the recording secretary please call roll? Kirsten Barnes. Here. Catherine Wooden Sprung. C. Michael Cooney. Here. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo. Here. Anna Marie Francois. Makita Gwinoshire. Present. Johanna Howick. Here. Alicia Hine. Present. Terry Jackson. Here. Bonnie Claff. Present. Kevin Kung. Present. Jim Marks. Here. Cynthia Martin. Here. Monica Martinez. Here. David Simmons. Here. Tina Sloan. Here. Andrew Wall. Here. We have a quorum. Wonderful. Thank you. Executive Director Sandy, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, Madam Chair, please stand. Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United mm -hmm. States of America and to the republic mm -hmm. for which it stands, one nation, what? under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. My script. Well, it is my distinct pleasure now to introduce Corey Jones to the commission as the new student liaison. Hello, Corey. Uh, Corey. No, no. <laughs> Corey is currently pursuing her MA in education curriculum and instruction and both a multiple subject and education specialist credential at the University of the Pacific. She received a BA in diversified curriculum and instruction with a concentration in science. That was in 2018 at UOP. She found her passion in social justice and education through her service in the community involvement program which is a scholarship and retention program granted to first-generation college students from Stockton. Corey's experiences with co-creating a mentoring program solidified her career goal of becoming a teacher. Lucky us. She believes that effective teaching truly shapes minds, innovation, and policies that are equitable. Her experiences with injustice, racism, and lack of representation in high places empowers her to be a force of change in education. She is excited to be given the trust and responsibility to represent and uplift the voices of students with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. She's honored and excited to be a part of the team. Welcome, Corey, and would you like to say anything to our group? Um, well, I don't have a lot to say, but I just <laughs> feel like um, you said you said a good chunk of, of I guess, what I, I really wanted for all of you to know. Um, but I am really excited to be here and I'm excited to be a part of this process, to be in these meetings with you all and to really go through these agenda items. So um, I just want you all to know that I'm very open. If there's any time that you would like to hear my perspective on something, I am more than willing to speak about it. Um, and I'm also, I'm also very willing to speak without being asked as well. So I, I, hope, I hope we all get acquainted it really sucks. I can't be with you all in a room because um, I just want you all to know I'm a hugger. So I would probably hug all of you. Um, but I know that at this time, I can just give you a virtual hug. So just thank you for welcoming me, um, Ms. Sloan, and, um, and everyone else here. Thank you, Corey. And please feel free in all of our agenda items to raise your hand and, and speak whenever you want to. All right, we have a few general announcements this morning. First, I'd like to share that staff has developed an online submission process for members of the public wishing to submit written comments to the commission regarding an agenda item. Please refer to the meeting agenda under the written comments procedure section for detailed information on the process. Next, I'd like to remind everyone that the meeting procedures before we get to today's agenda, because many of us are working remotely, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. Staff is maintaining a minimal presence in the commission building, but everyone else is participating from their own locale. 
Microphones, we'd like you to know that everyone's microphone is muted to eliminate any background noise that may hinder others from hearing what's being said. Commissioners and presenters can unmute yourself, but please mute your microphone after you're done speaking. With respect to Zoom identification, we'd like to ask that everyone check their Zoom identification and make sure it contains your first and last name accurately. This is very important for those who want to make public comments so we're able to call on you appropriately and also so that we can all get uh, names accurately recorded in the record. When commenting and asking questions, commissioners, some of you may be using the video audio functions and some of you will be using audio only. Commissioners that would like to speak, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Uh, with respect to motions and roll call vote, because this is a teleconference meeting, we need to conduct each vote by roll call. This is going to take a little time, so please bear with us as you have seen in the past. Just before the vote, we'll remind everyone to make sure you're unmuted so that we don't miss anyone's vote. There's a time designated for public comment. If you wish to speak on a specific item, please email your request to comments at ctc.ca.gov or call 916-322-6253 and indicate which item you wish to speak to so we can make sure to call on you at the appropriate time. Know that all of this information appears on the agenda as well. Please make sure the request includes your full name, your phone number, if participating through phone only, your affiliation and the agenda item number and title. Make sure the name you provide matches the name used to join the meeting. At the appropriate time, the meeting host will change the individual's permissions and ask that they turn on their camera and unmute the microphone to share their comment. At the conclusion of the speaker's comments, the meeting host will remove the individual's permission and their camera and microphone will be disabled. Each of our committee chairs will have the discretion to set a time limit on comments depending on the volume of speakers seeking to speak on a particular item. We ask that you keep your remarks brief and focused on the particular item you're speaking to. You'll get a one minute warning and we'll be asked to finish your sentence before being muted by the meeting host. Also, just like an in-person meeting, this meeting is being recorded. After the meeting, the archived audio and video will be available via the commission's website. All right. Moving to agenda item 1A, item 1A is the approval of the August 2020 minutes. We'll need to make three separate motions to approve the ad hoc committee, executive committee and regular session minutes. I'd like to remind everyone that only those who served on each committee can make the second, can make and second the motion to approve the committee minutes. So first, do I have a motion from a member of the ad hoc committee, which is Kirsten Barnes, Alicia Hind, or Kevin Kong to approve the August 2020 ad hoc committee meeting minutes. So moved. So moved by Commissioner Barnes. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Kong. Discussion? All right, will the recording secretary call for the vote? Kirsten Barnes. Aye. Alicia Hine. Aye. Kevin Kuhn. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next, do I have a motion from a member of the executive committee to approve the August 2020 executive committee minutes? So moved. Moved by Commissioner Cooney. Do I have a second? I'll second. Seconded by Commissioner uh, Mike. I think I saw first. <laughs> Discussion? All right, will the recording secretary call for the vote? E. Michael Cooney. Aye. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo. So I was absent, I abstained. Adisha Hai. Aye. Kevin Kang. Aye. Monica Martinez. Aye. Tina Sloan. Aye. 
Do I miss anyone? Motion carries. Thank you. Finally, do I have a motion to approve the August 2020 minutes? So move. Moved by Commissioner Martinez. Do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Barnes. Discussion? Seeing none, will the recording secretary call for the vote? Kirsten Barnes. Aye. C. Michael Cooney. Aye. Marisol Delatore Escobedo. Again, due to my absence, I abstain. Johanna Howick. Aye. Alicia Hine. Aye. Perry Jackson. Aye. Bonnie Kla. Abstain. Kevin Kung. Aye. Jane Marks. Aye. Cynthia Martin. Aye. Monica Martinez. Aye. David Simmons. Aye. Tina Sloan. Aye. Motion carries. Super. All right, the next item is 1B, approval of the October 2020 agenda. We have a revised item 3B. Do I have a motion to approve the October 2020 agenda? Uh, moved by Commissioner Clatt. Do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Kung. Discussion? Seeing none, will the recording secretary call for the vote? Kirsten Barnes. Aye. C. Michael Cooney. Aye. Marisol Delatore Escobedo. Aye. Johanna Hartwick. Aye. Alicia Hine. Aye. Perry Jackson. Aye. Bonnie Clark. Aye. Kevin Kung. Aye. Jen Marks. Aye. Cynthia Martin. Aye. Monica Martinez. Aye. David Simmons. Aye. Tina Sloan. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item 1C is uh, approval of the October 2020 consent calendar. Do commissioners have any items they would like to consider in closed session? Commissioner Clatt? Um, I would like to consider number 29, Mendez, and number 30, Molyneux. All right, Commissioner Barnes. Um, actually, I don't want to pull anything. I need to recuse myself from one of the items. Do I do that right now? Yes. Yes. Okay, I need to recuse myself from number 88, Robert W. Duvall. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Marisol de la Torre Escobedo, sorry. <laughs> I got the first time to in there. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I also uh, need to recuse myself from one. Uh, let's see here. Number 98, Jennifer L. Smith. Thank you. Commissioner Martin. Thank you. I need to recuse myself as well from number 13, Jason Crawford, number 14, Melissa Farrow, and number 24, Sarah Martin. Thank you. Other commissioners? Excuse me, is it, can I repeat, is it 13, 14, and 24, right? That's correct, 13, 14, and 24. Thank you. Any other commissioners? All right, can I check with commission staff? Do you have each of those? Yes, we have recorded all of them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion to approve all remaining items on the consent calendar? So moved. Moved by Commissioner Cooney, seconded by Commissioner Marks. 
Uh, will the recording secretary call for the vote? Kirsten Barnes? Aye. C. Michael Cooney? Aye. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo? Aye. Johanna Howick? Aye. Alicia Hine? Aye. Terry Jackson? Aye. Bonnie Clark? Aye. Kevin Kahn? Aye. Jim Marks? Aye. Cynthia Martin? Aye. Monica Martinez? Aye. David Simmons? David? Uh, oh. David, you muted. There you go. Did you say it one more time, David? I don't think we heard you. Oh. <laughs> Tina Slow. <laughs> Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, agenda item 1D is the uh, chair's report. And on my script, it says an opportunity to say what I wish. And boy, is there a lot that could be said right now. Uh, to say we're living with uncertainty is quite an understatement, but that is uh, what I keep thinking about this morning. And the fact that our educators are working harder than ever, they're wearing down faster than ever. There's a great emotional toll on their lives, on our lives. And when I say educators, I'm talking about all school staff who are supporting our students. I'm talking about all of our educator uh, preparers who are preparing our new educators and administrators and service personnel. Their work and our work are especially revealing the hidden lives of students. We're seeing stark inequalities in ways that we have probably never seen before, for many of us so up close and personal. Um, we are more than ever reminded of our moral obligation to students and families and educators to change this, to right the wrongs, and to, to help our educators have a greater sphere of influence. The needs of our educators and our preparers of our educators are, are changing so rapidly right now in these, everything is so uncertain. And so we also have a professional obligation to them to rise to this occasion to, for them. And, and we know this and staff know this and we, we're all working very hard to in some places in our state, children are going back to school in person. Um, in some places, our pre-service candidates are also going back to school, but in many others, they're not because there are complications and there are risks. It's all uh, extremely complicated right now. And it changes as quickly as we can come up with the solution. But today we'll continue to work on solutions and the best of which involve a collective, preparers, schools, families, our state agencies, the joint CDE CTC state board letter that was shared yesterday is a start. This letter was uh, posted on CTC news and um, with the title strategies to strengthen EPP and L LEA partnerships during COVID-19. Um, I, I think it is not only significant in some of the ways in which the three agencies are looking at how we can potentially strengthen those partnerships, but it is um, the first of what I hope will be many more collaborations to work on what we need to do for our children and families in the state and educators. We also have new opportunities here with strategic planning. This is another start for us that we're gonna hear more about today and discuss. And I think we're better positioned than ever to understand what needs to be and what can be to make education for all actually exist. With the commission, we have jurisdiction over some of that, as you know, very important parts of that. And we've gathered feedback from our stakeholders um, and you to see what needs to be done in our strategic planning process. Um, we have some concrete and effective things to work on, and we have opportunities to look at everything through a new lens and at least consider paradigm shifts. This doesn't mean we throw everything 
out with the bathwater, but COVID and our courageous citizens standing up for racial justice are showing us that previous paradigms aren't working for all students and families. So I think this means learning. We talked about this. Uh, Executive Director Mary Sandy and I talk about this constantly. And we talk about what we can do to help us all with ongoing learning and create opportunities for all of us here on Zoom to learn new things, to learn about educator preparation practices that could be transformative to our work. So we will be bringing more of that learning to all of us, I hope. Um, so while there is so much I can say, and while there is so much uncertainty we can point to, I think there is also a great deal of hope that has um, been revealed to us as well. So I want to leave us on a message of hope, and I want to turn now to uh, our executive director, Mary Sandy, for her comments. Thank you, Thank Madam, you Madam Chair. Chair. Which thing do I do? I do, I do unmute? Okay, is that better? So an echo, hearing me twice is probably not good for anyone, uh, especially me. So uh, good morning, commissioners, uh, stakeholders, staff. There's a handful of us here uh, holding down the commission meeting room, uh, waiting, waiting for you all to come back. Um, and it's ridiculously good to be together. Uh, I don't know how the rest of you feel, but just to see your faces and to be here doing the business of the, the agency together uh, feels really good. Um, so I would really like to extend a warm welcome uh, from the team here in the building to Corey Jones. Uh, we will hug you right back as soon as it's humanly feasible to do so and welcome you to this table. Um, very excited by what you're attempting to do in your preparation pathway this year, and we'd like to hear about it as you go. Uh, secondly, I'd like to introduce a new member of our Professional Services Division staff, uh, Ms. Christina Navarro. Let's see, I'm hopeful that you are in, that, that we can see you and perhaps you can wave to someone. There we go. All right, there she is. Uh, good morning, Christina. So for the last 15 years, uh, which con constitutes her entire educational career. Christina has worked in the Fremont Unified School District, where she also attended school as a K-12 student. She's an amazingly stable person. That's a good, good quality here for, uh, for working at the commission. She began teaching at Irvington High School as a social studies teacher and eventually also served as the, uh, at the site as an, act as an activities director and assistant principal. Eventually, the superintendent and the principal of American High School asked her to join their administrative team as an AP. I think that's an administrative, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure what AP stands for here, but you can explain it to us at some point, uh, to help turn the struggling school around. I think it's an assistant principal. Thank you. After getting married and starting a family, Christina decided to step away from the administrative realm, and the superintendent asked her to consider taking over uh, the, the induction program for her school district, a role she had never considered but has come to love. The sum of her past experiences has prepared her well for the challenge of serving as a commission consultant. She says she's excited to join this dynamic team, and we're very excited to welcome her into the family. So welcome, Christina. Um, I really so want much. to I, I really want to appreciate um, Commissioner Sloan, Chair Sloan's remarks this morning and um, the the sobering thoughts about what it means to be back in school as well as the hope for the future. I find that my optimism sometimes is a cover for not looking too closely at the realities uh, that that real people are experiencing right now. I was listening to NPR on the way in and uh, listening to interviews with teachers, teachers who are simultaneously operating this type of classroom and homeschooling their own children and trying to manage the needs of all of these individuals um, appropriately, effectively, and the strain on them is not inconsiderable. It's, it, and, and what they are experiencing with their own families as they're trying to support all of our families in their classrooms, um, this is hard, and I have renewed and constant respect and admiration for the people who step into the classrooms with our children in Zoom and in whatever capacity that they can 
to, to keep this work going. Um, Commissioner Grinnell Shire and I had uh, the opportunity this week to speak on a panel for the, the, the launch of this year's Teacher Residency Lab, which is a group that um, has come together as a, as a community of practice, if you will, around the residency programs that we have funded in the last two years, and it incorporates other residencies uh, that have been ongoing as well. You, you may recall <laughs> that in different times, we funded 38 residency programs to get up um, and, and really launch a new model of partnership within their districts and their with their higher education partners. This is very exciting work. I think it's very important for us to keep our eye on uh, robust, high quality teacher preparation and to not allow um, vacancies and, and even chronic vacancies to, uh, to impoverish our view of what it takes to be a teacher and how well we can do in preparing them. These 38 programs in the residency lab um, gave me an opportunity, and I, I think I can speak for Marquita as well, to, to be with a group of people who weren't, uh, the focus of our attention was not a pandemic, uh, the climate, forest fires, uh, you know, or any of the other myriad pressures that we're experiencing right now societally. It was on uh, how are we going to do the very best we can do to prepare teachers in this environment with the kinds of uncertainties um, and variabilities that we find in our settings and our schools. And it was very encouraging. It left me feeling optimistic without ignoring the need to also uh, remember the realities that, that we're all trying to do this within. So that was a great experience this week. So I will just close with uh, this meeting. I've heard a couple of uh, comments from commissioners and stakeholders that this seems like a light meeting. Um, it's, we've got some very good substance here to dig into uh, from the, the Title II report, which gives us a, an important annual look systemically uh, at some very important things, uh, to a deeper discussion about collaboration, which has been challenged somewhat in the ways we've had to remove ourselves from one another. But as we talk about that at the table today, we get back to some bedrock fundamentals for this commission. Uh, talking about special education and how we bridge uh, from what we have had been doing to prepare the special education workforce to the new uh, standards and, and credential structure. Uh, talking about the local assistance grants um, and bringing you up to date on where, where that has gone as one of our initiatives. Uh, so we have a rich morning of discussion. Um, we have a longish closed session. Uh, and then tomorrow we will have our uh, um, program review, program approval, uh, new programs that are seeking approval from the commission and update on the budget and the legislature, our professional practices work, and then a time to dig in a little bit around strategic planning. So we are look, looking forward to a good meeting with you commissioners and um, really glad that we're all here to do this work together. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Sandy. Sounds like a meaty agenda to me. You put it. <laughs> oh, Madam uh, Chair, Madam Chair, yes. can I? I'm, I'm sorry. I was, I was, Hyju's giving me the evil eye. I forgot to mention something I'm supposed to mention, and that is yeah. that at next meeting in the December, uh, at our December Commission meeting, uh, we will include a, an election for the chair and vice chair. So just everyone be ready for that. Okay. Thank you. Now that really does conclude my report. Okay, good. Yeah, you, know, you don't want Hyju giving you the evil eye. No. <laughs> All right, do uh, agenda item 1F, do any commissioners have items to report? Commissioner Barnes. Hello everyone. Um, just hope everyone takes a deep breath and, um, and stay focused because I know there's a lot going on. Um, I will say it was, it was hard for me to um, not be at work today. Um, just because of so much going on with the students. Um, and uh, I think I've done more CPS reports and suicide, um, uh, kids getting them to the hospitals um, because they are suffering so much and their, and their families are suffering. Not to be a, a, a downer here, but you know that's the reality we're facing. We even have a staff person who is struggling. Um, and so I think you know, this is, uh, as this goes on, you know, we just gotta take deep breaths and keep checking in on each other. Um, you know, thank you 
Director Sandy for doing a check-in, you know, when everything was going really bad, well, everything's still going bad, but um, I just felt it was, it was important for us to check in on each other because we are a family. Um, you know, we used to get together several times a year and learn a lot about each other. Um, and then thinking about teachers, um, I know in our district, we've been having to have the talks because um, I'm on the negotiation team and some of our new teachers are really stressed right now, not only being a new teacher teaching this way, but the reality of the unknown of what about next year? Am I going to have a job? Because we nobody has any answers about how the budget's going to hit. You know, there's projections. Um, you know, 10 years ago when we went through this, there were rifts, but there wasn't all this other stuff going on. And so that concerns me for our, our, new, te our new teachers, new counselors, um, somebody thinking about going into the profession. Just when we were seeing a rise, that I'm just worried. I, I had a new teacher come to me and say, should I just start looking for another profession if I'm going to get let go? And, you know, I tried to talk to them and said, you know what, we don't know yet. We don't know. But reality is, I don't know that they'll have a job next year. Um, and that's hard to, to tell someone who just got started, who's so excited. And I'm not trying to say that so, so people don't go in the profession. What I want to say is just hold on tight. Don't don't panic yet. Don't don't quit. Don't change your route. Um, this has been a crazy ride. So, you know, I don't have answers, but I wanted to bring that out there so that as we're looking at what we're doing here, we think about that too, because um, we have people scared. We have people who are getting ready to retire in a few years who are scared. So it's up and down and up and down the gamut. Um, and that's not just for teachers. That could be anybody in the profession. That could be the bus driver. That could be the custodian. That could be the superintendent. I mean, everybody is, is just on edge. Not only that, but we, I know we feel like I know in my district, we feel like we're failing our students because they won't turn on their camera. They won't return my call. Um, we go to the house, knock on the door. You know, they're in there, but they won't open the door. They're kind of shutting down. They're just like, I'm tired of everybody calling me, emailing me. Um, I just, my heart just hurts for everyone and, I'm, and, and, and our students from the kindergartner to the high school senior. Um, so with that being said, <laughs> Um, I, I'm very, you know, I, I think moving on, there's a lot that maybe we can do to, you know, think about those things when we're um, making changes or instituting programs or whatever. Um, so on the flip side, anyone looking for some good professional development, you don't have to be a school counselor. It's for everybody. It starts tonight. You can still register. It's called Revolution, Equity, Disparities, and Student Mental Health um, by CASC. And tonight, the uh, which the good thing is you don't have to attend virtually. You have two months afterwards where you can look at the sessions because everybody is like done like looking online. But tonight, um, I know we can't do it, but um, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris is the opening speaker. So anyway, this is open for everyone, teachers, parents, counselors, psychologists, administrators, anybody. So if you're looking for some good, maybe something to re-jump you or give you some ideas, Please think about it and have a good day. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes, for um, reminding us so much about the human element of all of what we're experiencing and for reminding us to check in on each other at all times. And um, regarding your last announcement, CASC, could you say the full name of that organization? California Association of School Counselors. Okay, so people can just look that up and they'll likely find what you were talking about. All right, super, thank you. Um, okay, Commissioner Jackson. Hi, good morning. And I just really want to um, appreciate the remarks that Commissioner Barnes made. Um, you know, I'm not that far removed from, you know, a 34 year career in the classroom and I'm still pretty much in touch with educator friends who are, um, you know, they're, they're putting their all in there, but it is, it's, it's wearing and it's tiring. And I just really want to, um, say to all of you, you know, that we're with you and our hearts are with you and with the families and with the students out there. And just in the vein of um, what, um, you know, Chair Sloan said, 
Uh, I just want to give a shout out to Terry Clark and to Aaron Scoobel, uh, my office, the teacher and leader policy office at the, at the department had a chance to review uh, or give comments for the National Council on Teacher Quality report for California. And um, we reached out in the vein that you were talking about of collaboration and, and really received some really good feedback from, from uh, Terry and Aaron to include in the report. And I just wanted to say um, publicly, thank you on behalf of my colleague, Tara Bennett Brown and the teacher and leader policy office at the department. Thank you, Commissioner Jackson. Um, Commissioner Martin. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the way that you chair our meetings, Tina. The, what, uh, I think it's the hardest time to be a new commissioner because ever since I've started, we've been virtual. But to all of my fellow commissioners, I want to say thank you for welcoming me. And Corey, you're starting today. And what you said about virtual hug and being able to be in the same room together, we're not. And yet we are, and there's something about and the intimacy that happens in, a, in this setting, although we're distant, I do feel as if I'm getting to know each of you fellow commissioners. And I wanna say a heartfelt thank you to Mary, the way you've onboarded and helped me understand the work that we do here. And I wanna say thank you to the entire commission staff. I did have a chance to meet you in person when I first started, um, I think it was in January and um, great introduction. And Terry, congratulations to you and your transition. I'm so glad I got to be introduced to the work that you've led for so long in the commission. And so um, in your opening comments, our chair today, you, you talked about the humanity and then Kristen or Kirsten, I don't know if I'm saying your name wrong, sorry. And Terry, I'm gonna echo that. And at the risk of taking too much time, um, I'm gonna, I have an offering for all of us. I wanna say a thank you to our teachers who are doing this work with their full heart. Um, and I have an encouragement around the teachers that are worried, should we do this? Should we get into this? What's going to happen with layoff notices? Does teaching matter anymore? How do I do it? And Mary knows what I'm about to share because I've shared it with her. This is a letter that I hand wrote to the commission in 1987 when I was graduating from college in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Before we had email and any other way, I contacted the commission because I was moving back from Wisconsin to California because I wanted to be a teacher and I didn't quite know how to get my credential. I didn't know how to get a California credential because I had a Wisconsin one. I still have this and to think where, we, where I am now as a commissioner to the group that I wrote to and I want the commission to know that you responded quickly. I hand wrote this letter and I got it. It says received January 23rd, 1987 and I wrote it on January. 15th, I think. So I got a quick response with everything I needed to do to um, get a California credential. So here I am this many years later. And what I want to is to offer encouragement and I'm gonna share a poem. <clears throat> My background is as a literacy educator. And um, when Tina said there's, what do you turn to for hope? And where does the hope live? And how do you manage being too hopeful and um, not being hopeful enough. And so the offering I have is a poem by Maya Angelou called Continue in a world which needed you. My wish for you is that you continue. Continue to be who and how you are to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. Continue to allow humor to lighten the burden of your tender hearts. Continue in a society dark with cruelty to let the people hear the grandeur in the peals of your laughter. Continue to let your eloquence elevate the people to heights they had only imagined. Continue to remind the people that each is as good as the other and that no one is beneath nor above you. Continue to remember your own young years and look with favor upon the lost and the least and the lonely. Continue to put the mantle of your protection around the bodies of the young and defenseless. Continue to take the hand of the despised and diseased and walk proudly with them in the high street. Some might see you and be encouraged to do likewise. Continue to plant a public kiss of concern on the cheek of the sick 
and the aged and the infirm and count that as a natural action to be expected. Continue to let gratitude be the pillow upon which you kneel to say your nightly prayer and let faith be the bridge you build to overcome evil and welcome good. Continue to ignore no vision which comes to enlarge your range and increase your spirit. Continue to dare to love deeply and risk everything for the good thing. Continue to float happily in the sea of infinite substance which set aside riches for you before you had a name. Continue and by doing so, you and your work will be able to continue eternally. Continue by Maya Angelou and that's my wish for my fellow commissioners, our teachers, and the people doing this hard work. Let's continue. Thank you for letting me share a literacy moment in my commissioner report because literacy matters. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Martin. I just love the deep heart with which we approach our work here. All of you are just some of the most amazing people I know. Commissioner De La Torre Escobedo. Yeah, so um, I have a few things uh, to report. The first thing, um, I was going to report out back in August, uh, but I wasn't able to attend uh, the meeting. But I wanted to share with all of you um, my experience as an induction mentor. I mentored my colleague, Evita North, for two years. And, um, you know, from the trajectory of her individual learning plan and growth goals to her inquiry questions about her teaching and students, um, the Butte County Office of Education just provided her with such an authentic experience um, from start to finish. And, you know, of course, as we're, we're looking at our induction programs, you know, there's always, you know, room for improvement in terms of strengthening that link between what the candidates do in their preliminary programs with induction. And now considering our distance learning environment um, and what we're experiencing, we're going to have to, you know, continue to adapt or add layers and whatever that looks like as we prepare and keep our teachers in the profession. But the teacher induction program preconditions and standards were adopted before um, my time on the commission. And sometimes it's the case where we don't, you know, necessarily see our result, the results of our decisions, you know, over time. Um, so I wanted to make it a point to um, express my appreciation to our commissioners uh, who adopted those standards, you know, in 2016 and started those conversations. And let's see, the commission class of 2016, raise your hand. Uh, let's see, Madam Chair Sloan. Commissioner Rodriguez, uh, Commissioner Hind, Commissioner Barnes, Commissioner Klatz. Um, and I miss, am I missing anybody? Um, and I definitely wanted to express my appreciation to the CTC staff just for your years of work on induction um, as we you know, are preparing our teachers for this work. And of course, uh, you know, a shout out to Tracy Allen and her team at the Butte County Office of Education. Um, mentoring is definitely exper an experience I won't forget. And I look forward to doing it more in the future. Um, Madam Chair Sloan, you talked about this, you know, time of uncertainty. And um, it's been such an interesting time teaching US history right now uh, with, you know, honoring the passing of John Lewis, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, you know, looking at these, you know, questions in terms of why these protests are happening across, you know, our country, um, and of course, the upcoming election. I had the opportunity of attending the implicit bias uh, training for the CTC on September 3rd. And um, as a social science educator, I really appreciated the historical and social science analysis skills that were embedded in the presentation in terms of identifying bias, prejudice um, in our historical interpretations and how they influence, you know, what, why we think a certain way. And uh, from the start, uh, Dr. Marx mentioned how we need to, you know, agree to disagree, um, keep an open mind. And so many times our conversations, you know, come to a quick close or don't move in a direction of understanding and empathy 
uh, because of this. And given our current climate, um, it's so important that we talk about these issues with our students, um, especially these issues that deeply matter to them and directly impact them um, and their future. I found a great resource that I want to share um, from the Facing History and Ourselves uh, website. If you go to facinghistory.org, um, you'll find a great resource titled Fostering Civil Discourse. And uh, this has really helped me have those conversations with my students at the high school level. Um, and I strongly recommend it. And it also provides um, a variety of tips uh, to engage in the civil discourse with our students, for, you know, in a distance learning environment. And, you know, just to, you know, reiterate what has been said too, you know, ever since school started um, in August, there's been those days where I ask myself, can I keep on doing this? <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, my students give me hope. And that's what's what that's what's keeping me moving every day. So thank you, everybody. Big hug to you, Marcel. <clears throat> and thank you for sharing um, the outcomes of some of the decisions that we make. And um, I'm so pleased that 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 they were having a positive effect on your mentoring and your work. And, and what you just shared about fostering civil discourse is, is so important. Um, so hang in there. We're going to keep checking in with you. And you're so right. Other commissioners. Okay. I don't see any other reports from commissioners at the moment. Uh, do any liaisons have items to report? Uh, liaison, Corey Jones. Hey everybody. Um, I just, first I just wanted to say that my heart goes out to all of you. Um, I know that, I know that like the feelings are resonated with both people who are trying to become teachers and people who are teachers right now. It's a lot of connection with the feelings of uncertainty, of, of not knowing if this is the right path and not knowing if they can go on. And I'm just happy that I'm in a space of people who actually feel and can talk about that because sometimes it's hard for people to actually talk about it. And um, this is my first liaison report, so bear with me. and. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity to meet with my administrators and colleagues at the University of the Pacific. Um, and much of what they said to me um, just resonated with me. So I recognize that anyone who is teaching or currently trying to become a teacher in this ambiguous time just shouts resilience. Like all of us just, we're bouncing, we're bouncing back continuously. And despite all the hurdles, um, we still show up. Many of my classmates at Pacific are a mixture of interns and student teachers, single subject, multiple subject, um, and special education. There is grief, like a lot of grief in the loss of not having an in-classroom experience. And um, some students are upset and some are optimistic and some are just trying to make it. And sadly, um, some students didn't return um, this semester to complete their program. And I'm sure that that's probably true for a lot of other colleges as well. Um, from the comments and questions that they asked me, um, much of their focus was on just the process and the stages it takes to become a teacher and how sometimes that can just be discouraging. And one student even said, um, how much do I need to prove? That I'm, I'm, that I'm, I'm able to do this, and there has been a lot of confusion about the changes and the expectations for their credential, um, especially with students who are student teaching or interning. There's a lot of confusion about hours and um, COVID or online teaching. Like how, how, how do we do this if we're dual credential? There is, um, there's a lot of questions and a lot of concerns in that area. Um, 
it's it's surprising though, but all of all of the students though start talking about the marketability of a California credential. So we all know also how how strong um, our credential is in California. And we also we also read we also compare the feasibility of becoming a teacher, the struggles of credentialing testing and cost of testing. Um, and not necessarily feeling like we received a requirement of um, diversity or implicit bias um, courses or training when we're in our education preparation programs. Um, and last but not least, they have expressed their difficulty, some students not being placed yet um, with, with schools and some students who aren't able to be placed if they're not student teachers. So we have students who are educated in their early years of their, um, their educator preparation programs who aren't um, being approved if they're not student teachers to be able to do field work. And, um, and throughout this whole discussion, like I realized that there is seeming to be a misunderstanding or, or lack of connection among students, institutions, and the commission on teacher credentialing. Um, many students rely on getting information or updates from the university, um, but it's hard because sometimes you get unwavering answers. Therefore, I believe that a relationship does need to be established between students and the CTC earlier on in the educator preparation program. To me, like these connections that, and there's so many solutions on how this can work, but this connection will be valuable to students and their progress towards being a teacher and to the commission. Um, their concerns and ideas on, are what I wish to uplift and hopefully ground me in our discussions throughout my term as a student liaison. But the next steps for me, y'all, is that um, in the next couple of months, I'll be working with Pacific Administration to create a CTC group through an, our online Canvas site where all EPP students will be added to. I will provide this group with announcements about CTC meetings um, policy items and create guides to how to access information on the CTC website. And I'm planning um, to speak with the Bennard um, College of Education Senator um, at Pacific and discuss a schedule on monthly meetings with students to review our agenda items and having a brave space to encourage feedback and comments on, your, on the CTC website. And um, in the coming months, I hope to speak with other colleges with EP EPP programs and see what they have in place for their students and collaborate on how we can bring student voices to the table too. Um, thank you. Thank you everyone for hearing my report. Thank you, Liaison Jones, for that um, student voice that you were so thoughtful about all of the things that you wanted to say. And you said it in such an eloquent way. And um, this early relationship between pre-service candidates in the commission, that's something that um, we should really be exploring more. So I absolutely appreciate you taking the lead on doing some of this. And during our strategic planning, this is a, 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 an extremely opportune moment for us to really rethink that. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. The other thing I wrote down that I'm uh, gonna stick up on my monitor here, shouts resilience. I love that. So thank you. Uh, okay, uh, liaison Rodriguez. You here? Good morning, everyone, and what a wonderful and touching morning um, it has been. It's uh, I'd like to welcome uh, student member Jones, and uh, the uh, the CTC is very fortunate to have your energy and. I really enjoyed listening to your report and I hope that we meet soon so that I can give you a hug because um, I, I feel your warmth. And uh, Commissioner Martin, thank you so much for, for that beautiful poem. That was incredibly touching and, and sort of embraced everything that, you know, uh, Commissioner Sloan, Sandy, Barnes um, and De La Torre shared this morning. Um, it, it's been very touching and I'm super emotional just hearing the, um, you know, hearing from all of you. <clears throat> and what, what occurs to me as I've been listening, we're all in this profession because we love people. 
And, you know, in addition to being disconnected from people, we, you, with our current situation, we're disconnected from our students as well. And, um, you know, and, and I, I have found that I have to go out of my way to connect with colleagues, with friends, to make sure that we remember, uh, you know, wh who we are in this, in this, what feels like a, just this chasm in our, in our lives right now, in our existence. So that said, I will continue with um, the uh, State Board Liaison Report. We met on September 10th, and um, it was a, a monumental and, and uh, very uh, touching meeting because we said goodbye to Executive Director Karen Staff Walters. She'd been with um, the State Board for seven and a half years. Her leadership uh, ushered in the LCFF, the new accountability system, and she has resigned to uh, become the executive director of CESA. And I'm sure that her uh, work with the state board and everything that she did to support uh, superintendents will be, uh, you know, will, will, she'll bring that wealth into success and to strengthen that relationship. So, um, you know, we had an emotional farewell and heard from uh, Executive Director Sandy and I heard her voice come into the Zoom meeting and I was just like, yay, I know her. And uh, so that was, that was really exciting. Um, and so Governor Newsom has appointed Brooks Allen uh, to uh, step into this role. And he has experience with the State Board of Education, uh, but he's also a former civil rights attorney. And um, he had been staff counsel for the State Board of Education. Um, he worked with the ACLU and one of his uh, important cases is actually Williams v. California to improve public education. Uh, additionally, um, Governor Newsom also appointed uh, senior policy advisor uh, Deborah Brown, and um, she was the senior managing director for uh, the nonprofit Children Now. Um, and this is uh, a familiar name. Um, she will also be joining the State Board of Education, and it's uh, Rachel Massaro, uh, who we all know and, and appreciate her comments. Um, she will be joining us on November 1st as Deputy Legal Counsel and Deputy Policy Director. Um, so that's very exciting news. We also welcomed the new student representative, Zaid Fata, who had wanted to be a student representative on the State Board of Education since he was in eighth grade. And hearing him speak, I was just so inspired to think about the impact that we have on young people and the importance of student voice, right? You know, with which Corey just confirmed with her, uh, with her statements this morning, including the student voice in everything that we do to improve. Um, and so that brings us to the priorities of the state board as communicated to us by Superintendent Thurman and President Linda Darling Hammond. Uh, the, the biggest priority is closing the digital divide and looking at the, uh, you know, what Commissioner Sloan mentioned this morning, the inequities which have just been glaring to us in this pandemic. We knew they existed but we can really see them um, at a different level, just rearing their ugly heads as we have students who don't have devices, who, um, you know, as Commissioner Barnes said, uh, you know, we go looking for them and they just, they're, they've, they've disconnected, which is part of that, um, you know, the economic inequality, the emotional, um, uh, the social and emotional gaps that we need to fill, which is a huge priority in addition to the digital divide and making sure that students are connected. Um, a lot of work has been done, um, about 70 to 80 webinars to improve distance learning uh, with a huge focus on social emotional learning. And President uh, Darlene Hammond talked about how exciting it is, you know, when she's talking to superintendents or to other educational leaders that social emo emotional learning has taken a front and center stage um, in this process as we're addressing 
a lot of these issues during, during our pandemic response to teaching. And we're looking for ways to improve um, everything from, you know, looking at, we won't go back to business as usual. And I'm paraphrasing uh, what President Darlene Hammond said, because now that we've seen a lot of these glaring inequalities, we, it's, what we're being reminded of is that we have to uh, change the way we've been doing things, right? To address our student needs. And that's where student voice is so important. Uh, we approved the state seal of civic engagement. So, you know, this uh, kind of uh, dovetails with what Commissioner De La Torre Escobedo was talking about. And the state seal of civic engagement, it's uh, the intent of the legislator when they established it was to encourage and create pathways for pupils in elementary and secondary schools to become civically engaged in our democratic uh, governmental institutions at the local, state, and national levels. And there are, um, there's five criteria. The student must be engaged in academic work in a productive way, demonstrate competence and understanding of the U.S. and California constitutions. Uh, the only bark when I unmute. Uh, tribal government structures and organizations, the role of the citizen in constitutional democracy, uh, participate in civic engagement projects, demonstrate civic knowledge and skills, and exhibit character traits that reflect civic mindedness. Uh, and we added in during the meeting an addendum to the proposed item, which, which included cultural um, responsiveness, the looking at, at a lot of the issues that we've been addressing in our society with um, Black Lives Matter, with social movements that, uh, you know, again, have really shown a lot of the issues that we have in our country and in our state today. And um, lastly, uh, is the topic of the growth model, which is, you know, something that will be, uh, that the State Board of Education has been working on since 2015. And um, a lot of states have a growth model. Um, the following the decision to explore a residual gain model and initial technical analysis, the board has paused to gain a better understanding of the results of the model and engage with stakeholders. The work resumed in 2020. So this year we've taken it back up about you know, five years later after having started it uh, with multiple updates from CDE um, and California's assessment vendor on the continuing technical analysis. The state board expects to take final action on the model in March, 2021 with additional work to follow and discuss using the results of the uh, California school dashboard and how stakeholders can utilize this model. Um, and so that is, uh, we met for one day and these, this is the liaison report and where we are today. So thank you. Thank you so much, li Liaison Rodriguez, uh, for um, such a thorough report and, and all the heart that you bring to it. We're so glad you're still here with us. Uh, are there any other liaison reports? Okay, uh, before I recess the general session, I just want to acknowledge the extent to which our school institutions uh, are a, a support for our students, all of our students, uh, whether they're three, four, five, or 24. And um, I want to acknowledge also the challenges that our preparing educators are facing right now, not just with all of the uncertainty, but without the structures and supports of the actual campus life that they used to have. Um, and I'm talking about everything from ensuring they have enough food to eat, to um, a, a good roof, um, a, a quiet place to study and work and learn, um, and collaborations to do that. But um, I am seeing uh, more than ever, um, even amongst my own students, those kinds of very basic 
struggles with needs. And um, again, um, always reaching out and, and acknowledging where, where they are is so important for us. So I will now research, uh, recess the general session and move to the Educator Preparation Committee. Commissioner Mart uh, Monica Martinez will serve as acting committee chair again. Thank you so much again, Commissioner Martinez. And will you please uh, convene the committee? Great. Thank you so much, Commissioner Sloan. Um, and thank you um, to my colleagues um, for all of the inspiration and, and the conversation we've had that's um, so real and for the liaison reports. And I also just wanted to share my gratefulness of and, and uh, the value of having educators on this commission um, so that we keep it real every single day. And that's what you guys do for, for me. And I think you do for the commissioners at large and uh, you do a great job representing all educators. So thank you for keeping it so real and sharing your hopes and sharing your pain as well. So I just wanna add that appreciation um, as we transition into this work. So thank you very much and welcome uh, Azon um, Jones. And thank you for your enthusiasm as well. And, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to, uh, to be the interim chair for this. So the first item today is 2A, the annual report card on California teacher preparation programs for the academic year 2018-19. This item is being presented by Marjorie Sukow. This is an action item. Ms. Sukow, will you please begin? Good morning, commissioners. Agenda item 2A is the annual report card on California teacher preparation programs for the academic year 2018-19. Before we get into the findings from the 1819 report, I would like to provide some background information of what is annual report card, why do we have to do uh, annual report card, and when do we submit the report. The report is mandated by the federal law under Title II of the 1998 Higher Education Act. That's why we call, always refer this report as Title II report. Higher Education Act legislation was reauthorized in 2008 and sections 205 through 208 call for accountability for teacher preparation programs. There are three major reports developed from each Title II reporting cycle. First, there is the institutional report, a consolidated state report, and a compiled national report, and which is also referred as the secretary's report. Teacher preparation programs submit Title II to the commission in April every year. The state submit a consolidated report to the U.S. Department of Education in October, and the secretary's report is published the following April. So we follow the April-October cycle. This is the 20th report that California will submit to the U.S. Department of Education. Vestat is our Title II contractor, and they developed a web-based data entry tool called the Institution and Program Report Card, or IPRC. State report card is also a web-based paperless system. All 50 states submit their state report cards through this web-based system. And the deadline for states to submit the report card is October 31st. What is in this uh, annual report or Title II report? The Title II report includes data on teaching credentials only. That is, we report on multiple subjects, single subject, and education specialist credentials only. The report does not include data on services credentials or education um, or designated subjects credentials. Data reported for new credentials only. Since it is an annual data collection, they want us to report only the brand new teaching credentials issued every year. Pass rate is a big focus of this report. So all teacher preparation programs report on the following exams. The basic skills exams, and subject matter exams, that's our CSET, reading instruction competence assessment, our RECA, teaching performance assessment, our TPA. In prior years, before the reauthorization, we reported pass rate only for program completers. Starting with 2009-10, in addition to program completers, we have to report pass rates for enrolled candidates as well. So we submit program pass rate data for five different groups. Groups one is enrolled candidates who completed all non-clinical work. And group two uh, refers to all other candidate, enrolled candidates. 
program completed from current year, that is from the 2018-19 year, constitutes group three. Program completed from prior two years, that is 16, 17, and 17, 18, are groups four and five. Since institutions submit the information every year, we have the information for the 16, 17, and 17, 18. So we update the pass rate. But for groups one, two, and three, institutions submit individual level data to our exam contractors and we match the exam data. For each assessment, we have to show the number of candidates who took the exam, number of examinees who passed the exam, and the pass rate. In addition to this pass rate information, the report includes information on number of other topics, data elements submitted through the IPRC are listed on table one on page two. Similarly, data elements that will be submitted for the state report card are listed on table two on page three. As you can see, most of the elements listed from IPRC are listed on state report card. Since teacher preparation program submitted all this information in April, those data elements are already loaded in the state report card. Now we'll go through some highlights from the 1819 report. A total of 152 reports were submitted by 94 institutions. Institutions with a traditional drought and an intent drought must submit two separate reports. That's why we have 94 institutions submitting a total of 152 reports. The distribution of this 152 reports by route and by segment is provided on table three on page four. As you can see, we had 82 traditional reports, 58 university intern reports, and 12 district intern reports. Section one, program information is like a lengthy section. It starts on page five. Use Department of Education made some changes to the section. First in the GPA requirements for entry and exit from the teacher preparation programs, they drop the median questions. So now they ask only for GPA for admission and completion of the program. In the supervised clinical hours, they separated out the questions for traditional route versus alternative route. The big change was in the enroll enrollment section. In prior years, they asked for enrolled candidates and program completers are two separate categories that did not give a big picture of the total enrollment in the teacher preparation programs. So this year, they, the institutions report on the total enrollment and program completers as a subset of the total enrollment. The other benefit to this new changes, now we have demographic data for program completers as well. This year, for the effect, we had to show everything by the route, traditional route, alternative, IHE route, alternative, LEA-based route. So in addition to analyzing the data by route, we also analyze the data by higher education segment. We'll start with the demographic data. We have table 6A through 6H. They display the gender, race, ethnicity information by route as well as by higher education segments. Table 6A on page 8, as you can see, about one third of our enrolled candidates were male. More than two thirds, 71% were female, and 1% did not respond to gender question. The same tables, we have race and ethnicity distribution. Again, less than half. 45% identify themselves as white, another one third or 31% as Hispanics, 8% Asians, 5% African Americans, less than 1% American Indian, another 1% Pacific Islander, and 4% identify themselves belonging to more than two races. Again, 8% did not report race or ethnicity. Tables E and F on pages 11 and 12 display enrollment for the past five years. There was an increase of about, about 3,000 candidates, which translates to 9% increase between 14, 15, and 18, 19. The increase was in the alternative routes, while there was a small decrease of 1% in the traditional route. To give you a reference, about 80% of our uh, enrolled candidates are coming through the traditional route and 20% through the intent route. Moving along, table 6G 
and H, pages 12 and 13. Here we show the number of program completed for the past five years. As you can see, there's a steady upward trend for all three routes. 3% for traditional route and more than 100% for uh, alternative route. When all three routes were combined, there was an increase of 20% in program completers between 14, 15, and 18, 19. Table 7A and 7B and pages 13 and 14 show the distribution of program completers by subject area they're prepared in. Here again, you can see the difference between route. About half of the traditional route program completers are getting credentials in elementary education or multiple subject, whereas about one third of the candidates completing the program through intern route are getting credentials in special education. Now we'll move to annual goals, section two, tables 9A and 9B. US Department of Education also made some changes to this section. In prior years, teacher preparation programs should uh, set goals like give a quantifiable number in math and science and special education teachers. They removed that question because it was hard for the institutions to project uh, numbers. In, instead, they asked, did you set goals? Did you meet goals? And what are the strategies used to meet goals? So, and then this table summarizes the information from by route as well as higher education segment. Now we'll move to page 26. This is the first time we are reporting information on TPA. On table 11, we show the dis distribution of institution by TPA model. There are three commission approved models, Cal TPA, TPA, and FAST. About two thirds of our teacher preparation programs use Cal TPA and one third uses ATPA. CSU Fresno, they use their own model called FAST. TPA pass rate data provided on page 35 along with other assessments. In addition to this, all this quantitative data, we also have some sections with a lot of qualitative information, starting with credential requirements, standards and criteria. We use description of our alternative routes, program performance, and the criteria we use to assign low performing teacher preparation programs, how do we address teacher shortage? How do we implement teacher technology standards in the teacher preparation program? And finally, statewide improvement efforts to improve the quality of teacher education. So there are a lot of information in this report. Every data element reported by the teacher preparation programs are displayed via the Title II data dashboards. The entire file is posted below the agenda item so researchers can download the data and do further analysis. This provides quick access as well as transparency to the Title II data. Now I will turn this presentation to Fifi, so she will take us through the Title II data dashboards. Thank you, Marjorie. Good morning, Commissioners. The Commission's Title II website focuses on reported data in three areas, state trends, state highlights, and data by institution. We recently updated our data dashboards to include the 2018-19 data. Now I will share my screen to demonstrate how you can find the Title II website and highlight data that are available on the data dashboards. Okay, so the share screen is on the Commission's homepage. The easiest way to access the Title II dashboards from the Commission's homepage is through the data and reports link. You can also find the Title II website in the program sponsor section, but let's continue uh, using the, um, finding the Title II data dashboards from the data and reports link. So if you are following along, go ahead and click the data and reports, then click the data and reports highlighted in orange. On the data and reports page, there will be a list of topics but click on annual report cards, Title II. On the main Title II page, there is information about Title II and new information relating to the reporting process. Additionally, there are three sections, 
dashboards and annual report cards, background information, and contacts. To view the Title II data, click the dashboards and annual report cards. This section provides you the dashboard links as well as the PDF reports. We'll explore all three data dashboard pages. So let's start with the state trends. Here on the state trends page, you can view data trends on five different topics. With the 2018-19 report, we now have five years of Title II data on the dashboards. So let's take a look at the data trends for program completers. You can see the bar graphs show an upward trend of completers in the last five years. If you hover your mouse on the total, you can view the percent change from the prior year. Data are also available by program route. To view trend data by segment or institution, click the institution tab. The line graph here shows um, data by segment and also by program routes. You can also select an institution from the institution drop-down menu to view data by a specific institution. So let's go back to the main Title II page. Let me close this tab. And let's take a look at state highlights. So on the state highlights page, data will be defaulted to the most re recent academic year. You can select prior year data as well. But let's stick with 2018-19. So scrolling down, you can see information for the number of institutions that submitted Title II data for 2018-19. There are 94 institutions. And figure four lists the institutions. If you scroll further down, there's data on the number of institutions by reports and by programs. And they are disaggregated by program route and also by segment. Scrolling further down, there's information on entry and exit requirements reported by institutions. And you can use the program routes off down menu to view data by different program routes. Below that is enroll candidate and program completer data by program routes and segments. Data is also reported by gender identity and also by race and ethnicity. Further down, there's data reported for supervised clinical experiences and you can select the type of clinical experience information you wanna view. And then below that, you can find data on the number of teachers prepared by subject area and academic major for 2018-19 and view data by the specific program route. There's also data related to um, annual goals in math, science, and special education, specifically how many institutions met their goals. Let's see figure 21. And then lastly, you can view teacher certification exams pass rate by exam type, exam group, and by program notes. Let's go back to the main Title II page, and this time explore data for a specific institution by clicking the Reports by Institutions link. So again, the academic year will be defaulted to the most uh, recent uh, 
most recent year. For this demo, we'll look at uh, UCLA. Look at UCLA's data. So I'm going to use the search box, which is and select the University of California, Los Angeles, and click the arrow. On this page, you can always reselect the academic year and a different institution name, but we'll stick with these two selections. This dashboard is organized in four different sections, the program admission and context section, candidate information, goals assurances, tech and training, and teacher certification examinations. So let's take a look at the um, data in the program admission context section. So here we can see um, UCLA's uh, program information that they reported for Title II. Below that is their admission information. However, starting in 2018-19, formal and conditional admission information is no longer required for Title II reporting. But you can view the data reported for the prior years. Below that is UCLA's um, entry and exit requirements that they reported in Title II their GPA, and contextual information that they provided. I'm going to scroll back up. Now let's take a look at UCLA's candidate information. So here you can view UCLA's enrolled candidate by route. And in this case, they only reported the traditional route. Uh, candidate enrollment by gender identity as well as race and ethnicity. Below that, we can view UCLA supervised clinical experience information that were reported. The number of teachers prepared by subject area and academic major. And also in this section, there are program completer data. And as mentioned previously by Marjorie, starting in 2018-19, Title II now collects demographic data for program completers. Let's take a look at the next section. Goals assurances tech goals assurances tech and training. So this section is pretty straightforward. You can view UCLA's goal information um, and all the details um, can be is available through the uh, drop-down menu. You can view the reporting information on UCLA's assurances, use of technology and teacher training information. Since there are a lot of text in this section, you can hover over uh, the text to read its entirety. And then let's go to the last section, which is teacher certification examinations. Here on this page, you can view UCLA's pass rates by exam type, examinee group, and program routes. And with that, I will turn it back to Marjorie to wrap up this agenda item. Thanks, Fifi. Uh, before I conclude, I would like to thank all teacher preparation programs for providing data on time so that the state could achieve 100% response rate every year for the past 20 years. That's a lot of work. Without their continued support, state won't be able to submit this report to the US Department of Education in October. This is an action item. Staff recommends that the commission approve this annual report card and teacher preparation programs so staff may transmit a web-based version of the report to the U.S. Department of Education by October 31st, 2020. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. Great, thank you. Um, before we open up to public comment, I forgot to give the fine details earlier in, uh, when I opened up this section. Um, so I'd like to remind members of the public that wish to speak on a specific item to please email your request to comments at ctc.ca.gov or call 916-322-6253 and indicate which item you wish to speak to so we can call your name during the appropriate time. Please make the request, um, make sure the request includes your full name, phone number, if participating through the phone only, your affiliation and the agenda item number and title. Make sure the name you provide matches the name used to join the meeting. At the appropriate time, the meeting host will change the individual's permission and ask that they turn on their camera and unmute their microphone to share their comment. 
At the conclusion of the speaker's comments, we'll move to individual permission and the camera microphone will be disabled. Uh, Commissioner Sloan um, shared this at the very beginning and I wanted to share that again. Um, and we will now open it for public comment. Recording secretary, are there any public comment? Yes, we have one public comment. Rigel Spencer Massaro, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Good morning, commissioners. Rigel Spencer Massaro with Public Advocates. Um, uh, well, first I wanted to say to board member Rodriguez, thank you for announcing my um, departure from Public Advocates and that I'll be joining the state board next month. Um, and I just wanted to say what an incredible privilege it's been to work with this commission and staff for the past almost eight years. Um, I joined Public Advocates at a time when there was really hot advocacy at the commission. Um, and we were doing work really collaboratively and with um, just at an incredible rate of speed and attention to ensure that intern teachers had the preparation they needed to teach English learners. And that was especially interesting for me as a former intern teacher myself. And, um, and since then I felt very, very invested in the work of the commission and um, learned under Tara Kinney and, and can then continue this work for the organization. Um, and I just, I, I, I hope uh, you know that I speak your praises, um, particularly the staff at the commission are some of the hardest working, most thoughtful people that I work with. Um, and, and I think this body as illustrated by the comments here just does this work with such heart, attention and detail. Um, it's really very admirable. And I, I hope to um, continue to keep an eye and, and um, be in, in touch with you as I do, as I work at the state board. I, I, hope, to, um, I hope to get a, a, fair, a fair amount of the teacher quality ducat at the state board and continue in close collaboration with the commission and staff. Um, and so as usual, I, uh, we enjoy uh, looking at this report and thinking of it, of course, as more than just something we send to the federal government, but also as, I mean, there is so much information that staff puts together. It's incredible. Um, I only spent like 90 minutes preparing for these comments and I, I feel unprepared. Um, and I wanna say that um, for those of you who don't know, these data dashboards are incredible. They are, uh, from last year to this, they are an, an incredible improvement and they used to not exist at all. So um, my only question on the data dashboards, which I've only really scratched the surface on is, do we have ways of knowing how these are used? Because now there's just this incredible information. Um, you know, I can only, of course, think about like, are there ways to, um, compared to state averages or something like that. Last year, I remember having to dig through and see whether folks met their goals institution by institution. Well, Marjorie and Fifi have, have changed that. It's all very easy to see. So I just wonder, do you do, you do any kind of analytics and, and see uh, you know, how often folks are getting onto these and how are they being used? Cause it's incredible information. And I, I, I imagine it's hours and hours of staff time to design and realize. So um, just really want to give you kudos for that. It's incredible work. And I only worry that it's underutilized. Um, so you, you all have heard me comment for, for the past several years on this report. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, I just want to I'm, I'm like all of us trying to begin to grasp what it is that 2020 will do to our teacher workforce or is doing to our teacher workforce. And we're hearing as, as Executive Director Sandy mentioned this morning, the story on NPR about just the incredible toll that, um, that 2020 is taking on teachers and students. And um, I, I, I worry about the workforce a lot. And um, for years have, we've been, we've been grappling with this shortage and worry that we're only, that it's only going to get um, more pronounced. Um, anyway, you all know about that. I just want to highlight a few things that I saw here. Um, one is that yes, en enrollment is, it continues to tick up. Um, and if you go back, um, Marjorie uh, or Fifi shared a, um, on the dashboard, a, a graph you can see maybe the past, it was like five or six years. And, and if you go back prior to that, we, you know, um, before, uh, before the great recession, we were at a much higher level than we are now. So we still, although we are ticking up, we still have a long way to go. And our current rate is not sufficient to meet student need. So we did, we've seen in the past several years, really meaningful investment investments at the state level and the commission is doing a great job of tracking that information, but we are not where we need to be. And the kind of teachers you saw, you saw the increase from about 8,800 um, program completers to now we're at nine, just over 9,000. So it's a couple hundred we're seeing over a period of years for traditional route and for alternative route. And these are underprepared teachers, it's nearly doubled. 
um, from about 1500 to 3000. So the, the, the increases we're seeing are not the increases we want, they're not the ideal increases, the, the kind of increases where we know we have a fully prepared teacher who is more likely to be successful and stay. So I um, just wanna uh, remind us of that as we see these numbers tick up, we need, we need the numbers to jump more and we need them to be our fully prepared teachers. Um, I wanted to, uh, if for those of you that have the report open on another screen or something, I just looked at, um, I try to put some of these numbers together to tell a bit of a story. And I noticed, you know, if you look at, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking particularly at black, uh, prospective black teachers. So if you look at page eight, we can see, um, and, and this report's a little different. I, I did like how before y'all totaled it. So it wasn't just by route. I do like the breakout by route, but the totaling is also helpful. But if we just look, at IHE traditional root teachers from 2018-19, we had 3.7% of our candidates were African-American, okay? And if you go to page 10, you can see that the completers on traditional route is only 2%. And that's actually a really big difference. And if you compare to our other student populations, a decrease of almost a third between our enrolled and our completing black teachers. So I just invite us to look at these numbers and also that 3.7% 3 per, 3 um, two years ago in 2016-17, that was 4.6%. And prior to that, our total of black teachers, again, the total, so I'm not comparing apples to apples, was five. So we're, I'm not sure this is right to say, but it seems like a, a downtick overall. And then when we think about the enrolled versus the completing black teachers, this is concerning for us. We all... I think we're all on the same boat. We need greater teacher diversity um, in the state. And we've got, we've got, you know, for everyone who's getting into a program, we really wanna make sure we're doing everything we can to support their completion. And um, we do know too that um, black students in higher education face higher burdens of debt. Um, anyway, we won't go there, but I just wanted to pull that out. That struck me. Um, and we know too that the shortage and the underprepared teachers are disproportionately are affecting our students with disabilities. If you look at page 13, um, table um, 7A, we can see that for all, um, for all subject areas, you know, the majority of, it's pretty comparable across the routes, but if you look for special education, they are predominantly being prepared for the classroom in alternative routes. And I, you, you all know, I was an intern teacher. I think it's, a, I think it's a, a very important route to have, but to have, you know, so many of your teachers for special ed are our are, are highest need students where black students and English learners are disproportionately represented to have so many of them prepared through intern pathways um, is concerning. Um, so I uh, just want us to keep an eye on our highest need students here and the teachers supporting them. Um, it's one ecosystem, right? Those teachers and those students are one ecosystem and thinking about them that way is important. Um, so I really appreciate the dashboards are amazing. I really appreciate the inclusion of the TPA information here. This is really good stuff for us to continue to build out. Um, and I just uh, urge the, the commission it, with, its, with its voice to think about how in this crisis do we understand our teacher workforce and how it's impacting our teachers. Um, how are we tracking what's happening to teachers? I, I wonder if with CalSAS and the launch of CalSAS, there's something we can leverage there to understand, well, how many of these teachers are, are staying, are continuing to teach, et cetera. I am sure I'm at time. Um, I could talk about this all day. I encourage folks to, to delve into this information. It's, it's actionable and important. And I really appreciate Marjorie and Fifi for for really embodying the continuous improvement when it comes to um, this data and its reporting. So thank you so much. If uh, I, I will be commenting before you tomorrow, it's been an incredible privilege to comment before you. I wish we were in person so I could give hugs and say goodbye. But um, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Recording secretary, are there any other public comments? No, we don't have any additional comments. Thank you. Thank you. The public comment period for this item is now, now closed. Do commissioners have any questions or comments on this item? And you guys can just raise your hand virtually or um, through Zoom on their system if you have questions or comments. Okay. Commissioner Klatt has her hand up. Yes, Commissioner Collette. 
I, I thank you. I was trying to find the little virtual hand and I was struggling to find it. So thank you. Um, I have a question. There's so much data in this report. And so um, I, my question, I think there might be a really obvious answer for it that I just missed because there's so much. Um, in table 7D on page 15, um, there's a breakdown of academic majors and for the University of California, 92.5% are under other. And I'm just curious about that. Is that because um, there may be, I'm wondering, are, are there majors that maybe would have been under social science but aren't called social science? I'm just wondering if, if um, anyone can explain that. And again, I apologize if it's a really obvious thing that I'm missing there. But that seems like a big number to be other. May I? Yes, Dr. Sukal, go. Uh, this academic major is also another kind of, I would say, difficult section because it's not relevant to LEAs, it's only relevant to IHEs. And this is a national report. So they have this broad categories they use across all 50 states. So they don't quite, quite kind of jive with our category. So they kind of roll them up all in other. So that is the reason. And you, they are all showing up under other. The institutions put them in other, so we had to roll them up. But it, the reason is they're big major subject categories that the federal government wants us to use. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, may I also respond to some of the questions from uh, Rajal, if I may? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, first, it is a lot of work on everybody's part, but and it's a good resource. We do get a lot of requests from doctoral students, media, teacher preparation programs, new title to coordinators. If they want to know, this is a good reference. So we ref refer them to the, our dashboards, to the report. So it is well used by others. Um, and we also internally also we use this for our site visits. Accreditation staff usually use this pass rate data. So it is well used. And the ethnicity, this is the first year US Department of Education added a category called not reported. And 8% of the teacher enrollment is reported in that category. Before they did not. So we used to have a really nice spread. So I wonder whether that is the reason the black percentage of black. American candidates are showing less. That could be a reason. Before we did not have that category. And then on the goals, they took the quantifiable numbers, the, another change made by the US Department of Education. However, if you read through their comments and the strategies, that's a wealth of information. Like one institution said, we want to increase 16 math teachers, but we increased only 14. So they, you know, they achieved 90% of their goals. So Teacher preparation programs do a lot to, to increase math and science and special education teachers. We do see the enrollment of special education is higher in that uh, alternative route. However, for the uh, intent route, also same standards are used, similar to traditional route. And then all our candidates go through the same requirements and they do finish the program and become program completers. So I just wanted to say, and then they're on the whole, there are only 20% of our enrolled candidates, 80% of the our program completers are coming through the traditional route. Thank you, Dr. Sukal, for returning to Rigel's question. I appreciate that. And thank you for answering um, Commissioner Klatt's question. And we do know that you're limited in many ways by the federal government and the demographics and um, kind of data they're asking for. And I'm um, glad to see that people are using the, the data and the dashboards. Um, Commissioner uh, Chair Sloan, um, has raised her hand virtually. And for just a reminder for everyone, it is kind of complicated, but if you just open up your panelists and you go to the bottom, you'll be able to see where you have to raise hands. But again, I'm perfectly happy just to look at the screen. So whatever is easiest for folks. Commissioner or Chair Sloan. Thank you. Uh, I just had a question. Um, I had a, a couple of comments. I wanna echo um, Rigel Massaro's comments. Um, in particular about um, needing uh, to have more teachers come into the profession, but concerned that there are so many more um, coming in under alternative routes or in, in under intern credentials. 
Um, and the data that we have available to us now is incredible. And I wanna say thank you to the staff for this. The dashboards, I agree, are um, really, really spectacular. Um, I also uh, wanted to acknowledge, I think it's table 5A under page seven, that there, we used to have very problematic ways of showing clinical hours and these improvements are, are good because it was, it was hard to understand the difference between alternative and, and traditional the way it was before. It looked very wonky. Um, so I appreciate that. My question comes in um, under page 35. Let me scroll down here. Um, and I feel like I should know the answer to this, but I don't, I'm not clear. So table 14B has pass rates of all assessments taken by program completers. And uh, the pass rates for the CBEST and the CSET, I'm wondering why a pass rate for a CSET can be less than 100% and you can still have a program completer. You know, it should be close to 100%, but some of the programs are so small. If the test takers are less than 10%, 10, we cannot show them the number of people who passed. So when we do an aggregate pass rate, when we roll them up 152 reports, so that's why we are giving a range. So that's the reason it's not all 100%. So, so because we can't report on programs where the numbers are so small, we can't report that they passed. Yeah. I'm yeah, if the number of uh, examinees are less than 10 for confidentiality purpose, we do not show how many people are passed the test and no pass rate are reported for less than 10, fewer than 10. Chair Sloan, I think we need to look into this a little bit more and get back to you because this is the program completer table. So that, that is confusing also, I, I agree. It, it's not really very clear because it's hard to be a program completer and not have passed CBEST or CSET. So let us look into this. Okay, I appreciate that. And then, um, and then my question too is, I often get uh, confused with the TPA and where it is in our requirement policies. Is the TPA required for completing a program? I thought so, yes. So. Uh, so that one too, it looks confusing to me on here. Okay, but so I appreciate you you looking into that. Um, and then other than that, I would just like to make a request uh, to Rigel. We are happy that you are joining the state board, but if you could please come back and speak to this item uh, now and again, we'd very much appreciate it. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair Sloan. I'm sure we all feel the same way. Um, I do not see any um, hands up on the virtual. Um, what about on camera? Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, student Liaison Jones. Yes, so um, very similar to, um, to Ms. Sloan. Um, for table 14A and 14B, um, I was just a little, um, I'm a little confused if there is a table that does show the passage rate, like how how many people who attempt do pass um, these tests, and then also the Cal TPA and Ed TPA. And um, because from what I see, it looks that there's like um, people pass the Cal TPA at a higher rate than the Ed TPA. Um, I don't know if that's um, is that is that legitimate, or I don't know necessarily how to read this table. If I could respond to that, Chair Martinez. Yes, thank you, Terry, please. This is the first time we've had TPA data in this report at all. And pass rate data for an examination is actually in a different type of report. 
This report, because it's organized by the federal government, is about people who programs have defined as completers, enrolled members, enrolled and have completed all coursework other than clinical. So this one, this report does not look at pass rates for actual assessments. That report was last done, I believe in August of 2019 and will be done sometime in the 21 year again. And that report will give you that type of information. So you cannot really conclude what the pass rate is for an examination based on this report. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, let's see, uh, Commissioner Wall, I see that you have your hand up. So I, I want to echo my thanks to the to the staff for the tremendous work on this. I think one of the big challenges in presenting uh, data that is complex and is to, is to make it um, usable um, or uh, readable by by multiple audiences. And I think that the the dashboards um, in particular, but the report really do a, a really great job of that. Um, and and this is really important because uh, having been at a site. Um, there's a lot of time spent on compiling this data and submitting it to the state. And so then to see that it can be accessed um, through the dashboards, it can be broken down in several ways, um, is actually really meaningful institutionally. And, and one of the things I hope um, to, to, in making a comment here is to urge institutions to actually go back and, and use this data in their, in their institution-based reporting. Um, because I think sometimes we submit it and we don't do a good enough job of going back and, and using this data in other ways uh, other than just for the commission. And I think that it can be um, a real asset um, to be able to present information on a campus-based level. Um, and so I would urge institutions who might be listening to, to, to realize that and, um, and, and, and just appreciate the, the amount of work that's being done um, to, to both submit and then to um, make it available. So thank you. Great, thank you, Commissioner Wall. Uh, Commissioner Jackson. Yes, this is just a question, and maybe in another reporting format. Now that I know that you know this is for the feds, and there are certain things that you're reporting, but um, just a question about institutions that re that uh, received like uh, low, you know, low marks. Uh, not performing up to standards, uh, needing to go back and like refine things. Um, do we get a follow up if those institutions actually follow through with what they need to do and an update on whether their programs have now come up to standard? Um, because I know a couple were mentioned in the report and then uh, there were questions about do we see a progress in any other report or a follow-up. Right, thank you. Terry? And that question really moves towards the accreditation system. And in December, you will get the annual report from the Committee on Accreditation. In this report, the federal government does require us to define program performance in that section and who, which programs are low performing and which programs are at risk of low performing. That's section eight in this report. That is concluded in your COA report. And any institution that does not get full accreditation from the Committee on Accreditation is monitored by that committee and does have to come up to snuff. And so I'm looking at this page and I see the institution that's at risk of low performing. It has a revisit coming up early in spring of 21. And at this point, there are no institutions defined in this report as low performing. So it doesn't get reported on in this report, but yes, it is followed up on and it is monitored and they do have to improve and meet the commission standards. And we are starting to use test data, TPA data, RECA data in more ways in the accreditation system also in looking at that specific data. More on that at the December meeting in the COA report. Thanks, Terry. I got a little movie trailer going there. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, I don't see any other questions virtually or any other hands up virtually. Okay, uh, student liaison Jones. I'm just just building off of uh, Ms. Terry's question um, for for Ms. Clark. When it comes to the low performing um, schools, how long do they have to be able to get to standard? Because I know that the site visitations, I guess, are six, 
six years, do you all like not like, do you keep to the six or do you come back within a certain amount of time? Excellent, excellent question, excellent, excellent question. It is a seven year cycle, but they do not get that amount of time. The standard in the commission's policy handbook is they get one year, but okay. the committee on accreditation doesn't give them a whole year sometimes. There are times where they require institutions to report back quarterly or twice a year on their progress. And there would be a revisit or the committee would take action if they are still not done, but they've made sufficient progress, they might get a second year, but it is monitored on an ongoing basis. And so no, they do not get to go another six years before they have to show that they're meeting standards. Great, excellent. Um, seeing no more questions, this is an action item. Just giving you guys a second chance. All right, so this is an action item. Do I have a motion to approve the annual report card on the California Teacher Preparation Programs for the academic year 2018 to 2019? Okay, uh, Chair Sloan has so moved. Do I have a second? All right, Chair Barnes, or Commissioner Barnes, thank you very much. Notice I gave you a little promotion there for a second. Um, all right, will the, um, are there any further discussion on this? Managing too many windows, my apologies. Okay, not seeing any. Will the recording secretary call for the vote? Each member, please respond with an A, nay, or abstain. Recording secretary. Kirsten Barnes. Aye. C. Michael Cooney. Aye. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo. Aye. Johanna Howick. Aye. Alicia Hine. Aye. Perry Jackson. Aye. Bonnie Clark. Aye. Kevin Kuhn. Aye. Jen Marks. Aye. Cynthia Martin. Aye. Monica Martinez. Aye. David Simmons. Aye. Gina Sloan. Aye. Motion carries. Great. Um, thank you so much. And, and thank you, um, Dr. Sukau and um, Terry Clark, but to all the commission staff, as everyone has pointed out here for the amount of work that went into this report and, and also how this is um, then translated into the dashboards, which are a true national exemplar. So, so thank you for this. And um, the other part of the good news is that we're gonna move to a break. It's right at the top of the hour right now. So uh, we'll come back at 11.10. And um, just feel free to just uh, mute your microphones and turn off your video and see you guys at 1110. Um, Commissioner Sloan, it looks like we're missing Commissioner Wall and Martin. Should we wait a little bit longer or should we get going? I think we can just get going. Great. Thank you. Um, I now reconvene the October 2020 meeting of the Educator Prep Committee to order. We now, okay, so we have three more to get through for today, and then we have three to do tomorrow. Um, item 2B is Pathways for Current Education Specialist Credential Holders Interested in Earning the New Education Specialist Credential. This item is being presented by William Hartrick and Sarah Solari Colombini. This is an action item. Ms. Solari Colombini, will you please begin? Certainly, good morning, commissioners. At the August commission meeting, the concept of creating a bridge for current education specialist credential holders to earn the updated authorization statement that will take effect in the summer fall of 2022 was brought forward. Staff was directed to seek input from the field regarding possible pathways and to develop a plan for a bridge authorization. This item presents those pathways. The commission has been engaged in work to address changes in the ways that students with disabilities are served in public schools. This work includes the revision of educator preparation program standards, teaching performance expectations, and teaching performance assessments. In addition, the special education credential structure was revised to reflect a system that focuses on serving students based upon their needs as opposed to their disability category. 
The revised credential structure will reduce the current seven credentials to five, which can be found on page two of this item. The reorganization of the credentials and expansion of the authorization statement is what necessitates the development of a bridge for existing education specialist credential holders should they want to seek the expanded authorization. All right, uh, as Sarah mentioned, the new credentials place a greater emphasis on the individual student's needs, mild to moderate or extensive, and expand the disability categories for each authorization. This shift required a change in the authorization statements for three of the five credentials within the new structure, which also includes um, early childhood special education. A bridge option for existing education specialist credential holders would allow those teachers with the existing credentials to obtain the expanded authorization so they can work with a broader spectrum of students across more disability categories if they so choose. Uh, as a reminder, this would not be required of any existing credential holder. In Appendix A of the agenda item, you will find the specific TPEs that are not addressed in the current program requirements, but will be included in the new TPEs taking effect summer and fall 2022. The three possible bridge pathways outlined in the item offer flexibility to the existing education specialist who would like to obtain the expanded authorization. And these include completion of specific coursework, completion of aligned professional development, and or confirmation of prior knowledge and experience, which could be verified through demonstrated competence. Any one of these three or a combination could be used to verify that an existing ed specialist has mastered the additional preparation content. The table on page five clarifies which agency could offer and verify the various pathways. For example, an approved preliminary education specialist program could offer coursework and or professional development to satisfy the bridge authorization requirements. Uh, existing credential holders applying for the bridge would need the verification of the program sponsor, local education, or other agency to confirm that all the TPE requirements have been met. A sample verification form is in Appendix B, which could be used to show how that teacher has met the additional content requirements. So with that, staff is recommending that the Commission allow current education specialist credential holders to complete coursework, professional development, or demonstrated competence, or a combination of these to earn the equivalent authorization of the new credential, which will take effect in the summer fall of 2022, and that the Commission allow approved preliminary education specialist program sponsors, local education agencies, and statewide organizations to verify that a current education specialist has met the new TPEs represented in the expanded authorization as was presented in the item. Based on your discussion and action, staff will incorporate the commission's direction into the regulatory language, which will be presented at a future commission meeting. Thank you. Great, thank you both. We will now open for public comment. Recording secretary, are there any public comments? Yes, Harold Acord. Please unmute your microphone and turn on your camera if available and state your name and um, affiliation for the record, please. Hello, commissioners. My name is Harold Acord and I'm speaking on behalf of the 300,000 plus members of the California Teachers Association. Yeah. Uh, and I preface my remarks by a behavior intervention teacher and student success coach at a middle school in my district. I really concur with what um, Commissioner Barnes was saying earlier. I'm feeling that with my students. I am hearing them saying exactly the same things that um, Commissioner Barnes had, had shared with us. And so I really was moved by that and I feel that as a teacher. Thank you. Um, specifically as to this item, we just want to remind the commission that we had sent 
a letter on July 31st and a paragraph that is of real importance when um, the commission moves forward on this item so, is the one that states that we also note that the agenda item clearly states that current education specialist credential holders are not required to earn the new authorization. And we believe that the, the decision to do so must remain with the individual children and we recommend that language be included in any further regulations that the authorization must be obtained only with the teacher's consent. That is our area of concern. Um, we look forward to um, seeing in the regulations um, something similar in the local option to the local option authorizations and mm -hmm. we strongly urge it to be included in this authorization as well. And um, thank you for your time today. That is our comments. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your experience with the school year as well. Thank you. According to Secretary, are there any other public comments? We do not have any additional comments. Great. The public comment period for this item is now closed. Do commissioners have any questions or comments on this item? And again, feel free to um, raise your hand or um, use the uh, panelist section. Okay, Commissioner Greno Shire. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you. And thank you to Mr. Hattrick and Ms. Solari Colombini for this agenda item. Um, I want to just uh, say how pleased I am and support the recommendation. Um, the focus is clearly on student needs and level of support, which has been, which is consistent with what the commission has been talking about in regards to one system for all students. So I want to thank you for your work. Great. Thank you. Um, other comments or questions by commissioners? I see um, Commissioner Simmons. And then um, Student Liaison Jones, we'll go to you after. Thank you, Mark. I wanna say that I really appreciate this item. I think that it's a it's an excellent idea. It reminds me of the added authorizations that were here previously, which again, were a really good idea, but I think got sort of um, caught up in bureaucracy and were not as accessible as we had hoped originally. So I, I really like this option and I, I just hope that we don't let it uh, become uh, so mischaracterized and so difficult to achieve as what as what we found with the added authorizations. Uh, so what um, Harold had to say, I think, should inform how we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Simmons. Student Liaison Jones. Um, I just want to say that as someone who is pursuing um, an education specialist credential right now, mild, moderate. Um, I really enjoyed reading this item. I think that um, feeling need, and I love how um, I love how you all described it. Of it's we're trying to fill a need, not necessarily a specific um, disability per se. So I like that there's more need that's getting hit here, and I appreciate that. I think um, a couple of questions that I have is that um, are we planning for the current cred the credentials of um, mild, mod, moderate, severe? Are we planning for those to phase out as we bring in these two um, new credentials? And um, what, kind of, what kind of extra support are our institutions having, um, not only to prepare our students to complete these new TPEs, but within their course studies on how they're going to be able to um, just, I guess, uh, be more exposed to these TPEs prior to them being at their last stages uh, in their education preparation program. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Hilari Colini, do you want to take this question or Mr. Hattrick or Terry? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and start and Sarah, feel free to jump in. So the mild, moderate and mod severe and other credentials for existing credential holders um, will never be taken away from those existing credential holders. Those will continue. But beginning in summer and fall of 2022, the programs will no longer be offering those credentials 
they will be offering the new ones, mild to moderate support needs, extensive support needs, early childhood special ed, deaf and hard of hearing and visual impairments. So um, those all now have specific sets of teaching performance expectations, um, or they will starting in summer, fall of 2022. Um, Sarah, did you wanna take the second question? Certainly. So as, um, as the um, programs transition to these new teaching performance expectations and program standards, they were actually adopted in 2018, the new teaching performance expectations and program standards. So programs are in the process of transitioning so that they um, get ready to offer the or recommend their candidates for the new credential that will be offered in the fall of 2022. So um, staff at the commission works with programs to help them first transition to the new standards and then help them implement those um, standards and teaching performance expectations. And um, really the programs also problem solve together, work together to develop best practices and ways that um, they can do what's best for candidates and of course ultimately what's best for the students in California, so. Great, thank you. Um, and I really appreciate the conversation we had about this at our last meeting. Commissioner Hind. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, I'm ready to move this item, but I also wanted to um, just reiterate what Harold had said. I think it's really important that we um, continue on with this new, kind of new mindset way of thinking and that we don't need to have our credential holders run out and do a bunch of things if they've already been in the field for many years. Um, but also I think we're going to see a lot of people who have this credential, who have the original credentials, who are going to want to do, to take the courses and find out more to, on their own, um, seek out the new credentials as uh, I think um, our student liaison was saying, we want to um, better, our, better our profession, we want to know more, we want access to those other resources so we can serve all the students in our state. So I think that's great. Um, on that note, I would... Um, be willing to move that we um, I uh, accept staff recommendation. I, I can't find the motion. It's a two-parter. This one's a, a two-parter. <laughs> okay. So we have two action items to move on this. All right. So what's the first one? Okay. So let me read them out for you. So, um, so the first motion, if we have a motion to approve the options for current education specialist credential holders to complete coursework, professional development, demonstrated competence, or a combination thereof to earn the equivalent authorization of the new education specialist credentials going into effect the summer fall 2022. And the second action, okay. allow approved preliminary education specialist program sponsors, LEAs and statewide organizations to verify that a current education specialist has met the new TPEs represented in the expanded authorization as outlined in the table on page five of this item. So Commissioner Hyde, do you move um, to for both of these action items? I sure do. Great. Do I have a second? Okay. Commissioner Klatt, thank you. Are there any further discussion on action item one or two? Okay. Will the recording secretary call for the vote? Each member, please respond with aye, nay, or abstain. Kirsten Barnes? Aye. C. Michael Cooney? Aye. Marisol Dilatore Escobedo? Aye. Johanna Howick? Aye. Alicia Hine? Aye. Terry Jackson? Aye. Bonnie Clark? Aye. Kevin Kung? Aye. Jane Marks? Aye. Cynthia Martin? Aye. Monica Martinez? Aye. David Simmons? Aye. Tina Sloan? Aye. Motion carries. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hartrick and Dr. Solari Colombini. And again, thank you for the really great conversation that we had at the last meeting um, where we really dove deeply into this and appreciate the responses you made um, from that meeting. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So we're going to move to item 2C. Item 2C is collaboration between preparers of educators and the local education agency that employ program completers. This item is being presented by Aaron Sullivan and Cheryl Hickey. 
This is an information item. Ms. Sullivan, will you begin? Thank you very much, I'm happy to. Good morning, commissioners. This agenda item was developed for you in response to your discussion at your June meeting around the importance of strong communication and collaboration between the stakeholders involved in candidate preparation and support. To be clear, the collaboration discussed in this item is inclusive of that which occurs between preparation programs and induction programs, induction programs and preparation programs, and programs, whether preliminary or induction, in the employers that hire their completers. The item's been constructed to first outline the language and requirements that currently exist in statute and in the Commission's own adopted preconditions, common standards, and certain program standards around communication and collaboration between preparation programs and employers. This is followed by a brief discussion of the evidence that's currently provided by programs, which is included in the appendix, in order to demonstrate the communication and collaboration are occurring in a meaningful way and information on findings and accreditation related to the language and standards around communication and collaboration. After that, the item provides some examples of strong collaborative relationships that Commission staff have seen or are aware of. And finally, there's a section on the actions the Commission has taken in recent years to communicate to the field the importance of strong communication and collaboration between preparation programs and preparation programs and employers. Communication and collaboration between educator preparation programs and the local agent uh, and local and the local education agencies that hire their completers has long been of interest to both the Commission and the State of California. Beginning on page two of the item, staff has presented the statutory language and Commission adopted preconditions, common standards, and program standards language that include references to communication and collaboration and staff has highlighted the specific language in those sections for you. The appendix at the end of this item that shows the evidence that is specifically required from institutions, I'm sorry, the appendix at the end of this item shows the evidence that is specifically required from institutions and programs in demonstrating alignment to preconditions and standards. Commissioners will see that there are several places in statute that require communication and collaboration between IHEs and LEAs as well as within the Commission's own adopted preconditions for programs seeking initial approval and in general institutional preconditions, which respond to statute and regulations. For instance, you can see that um, highlighted language in Education Code 44227.5, which is in the middle of page two, is reflected in general institutional precondition nine, which is near the top of page four. Beginning near the bottom of page four, you will see that the Commission also has a number of places in both the common standards and certain program standards in which communication and collaboration between programs and employers is required. In some cases, the statutory language around communication and collaboration is also reflected in common and program standards. For instance, bullet three of common standard one is reflective of the language we previously saw in Ed Code 44227.5 and in Ed Code 44320. Um, also, Ed Code 44320 at the top of page three can be seen in the highlighted section of Common Standard 3, as well as the program standards that are excerpted in the item. As commissioners have read through this section of the item, um, Staff would be interested to hear commissioners' thoughts on whether the language in the standards is sufficient to capture the level of commissioner expectations and the requirement for authentic collaboration between programs and employers that is equally distributed between the two entities uh, and that ensures authority and responsibility between preparation programs and LEAs. So how does commission staff currently verify that programs are aligned with these requirements? The appendix that begins on page 15 of the item walks you through the specific pieces of evidence that are currently required for the preconditions, common standards, and program standards that are excerpted in the item uh, and with regard to collaboration between programs and, uh, and programs and their employers. And just a reminder, responses to initial program preconditions are submitted only once 
when a program is being proposed for initial approval. But general and program-specific preconditions evidence is due twice during the seven-year accreditation cycle, once in year one and again in year four. And any issues with preconditions must be addressed immediately due to their foundation in statute and regulations. Uh, you can see, though, that evidence of practitioner or faculty and instructional personnel participation in public schools is requested during both initial program preconditions and again in the general institutional preconditions. In year five of the seven-year accreditation cycle, evidence is submitted as part of program review, which evaluates alignment to program standards, and common standards review, which, of course, evaluates alignment to common standards. Uh, when reviewing the appendix, you will see that some types of evidence in include um, names of faculty who regularly teach courses in the prep program and the specific activities they've engaged in with K-12 communities. Um, you'll see requests for evidence of advisory groups that includes their names, affiliations. Um, we also request meeting schedules, agendas, and minutes from these meetings so that we can see the kinds of, of collaboration and decision making that's occurring. Um, looking specifically at common standards, um, you can see common standard 1.2 that evidence is required to demonstrate stakeholder involvement in the organization, coordination, and decision making of an institution's programs. And in Common Standard 5, examples of evidence may include workshops for local teachers that are provided by the institution, um, uh, teacher preparation grants that have been awarded to the institution and its programs, literacy programs run by program faculty or program candidates, uh, professional development programs offered by the institution, or any ways the program is continuing con to connect with and serve program completers and or the employers that hire them. Looking at the evidence required for program standards, we can see where preliminary programs are required to hold MOUs or partnership agreements with the local education ag agencies who host their student teachers and how those programs are responsible to train and support the mentors and veteran teachers who in turn support their candidates. We also see the evidence that is required from induction programs to show how they're using the individual development plans from their participants' preliminary programs to shape their induction experiences. Now, while the Commission's standards represent the minimum requirements for institutions and their programs, there are programs that find innovative and unique ways to meet the standards, ways that make sense for their program's design and structure, and that serve and accommodate the communities in which they operate. And through accreditation, we get to see this. But my colleague Cheryl Hickey will talk um, about this more in depth now during her portion of the presentation. Good morning, commissioners. So my colleague Erin Sullivan has reviewed some of the requirements for preparation programs as it relates to some collaboration and communication. Uh, your accreditation system is the means by which teams determine whether institutions and programs are in accordance with those standards and preconditions in Ed Code. During accreditation, the teams seek out information that will provide evidence um, that educated preparation programs are in fact working collaboratively uh, with their TK-12 partners in accordance with those standards. That is, in general, to design programs collaboratively, to develop um, programs, to implement and to assess the effectiveness of programs, um, and to implement programmatic improvements. So institutions and programs provide all of this required evidence um, that we have talked about. Um, you know, in responding to the uh, preconditions of the common standards and the program review. That information then is confirmed at the site visit, um, and additional information from interviews with key constituents um, is gathered by the team members to inform the team's decision on whether or not those standards are met. And I think it's important to put on the table as the Commission discusses this topic the following considerations. So there are a number of ways that collaboration can take place between an educator preparation program and its T the TK-12 schools and districts that they serve. And each local context is unique and different. While there are some areas of specificity, the Commission standards do not generally prescribe how an educator preparation program must work with its partners and stakeholders. It doesn't prescribe what collaboration should look like, but that it must collaborate. So determining the extent to which an institution is effectively collaborating with its partners is probably among the most difficult part 
of an accreditation team's work and probably the area where it's most difficult to determine whether the team got it right. And I want to put forth the challenge here. So accreditation teams look for evidence and ask questions that will shed some light on how established and how effective these collaborative, collaborative partnerships may be. So on the top of page 10, I tried to give, we tried to give some um, uh, sense of the kinds of questions or the kinds of areas that they, they probe to figure out how these partnerships are working. So who are the partners? What kinds of mechanisms are in place for regularly getting feedback and inputs on programs? Are there advisory boards or focus groups? Or how exactly does the institution do that? Who serves on these committees or advisory boards? What is their role? Is there any major constituency missing? Maybe they're only talking to certain districts and not all of the districts that they serve. Um, you know, how often do they meet and what do they meet about? Um, is it meaningful discussions that they have? Are there examples of programmatic um, changes that have taken place um, as a result of these uh, conversations, the data that's gathered, those kinds of things? What seems to be the balance of authority and responsibility between the partners? Um, you know, what are the partners saying about the collaboration? Are they valued? Do they feel valued in the relationship? What are examples of those joint projects or initiatives? So there's a lot of different ways. You know, what are employers and mentor and master teachers saying? So there's a lot of ways that the team tries to get deeper into this conversation and to find out whether collaboration is, in fact, taking place. Determining the viability of a collaborative partnership is tricky. Um, it's not as cut and dry as determining, for instance, whether the institution's advising materials are, are up, accurate and up to date or whether the curri curriculum covers a TPE. And I just want to show you how it may play out at, at a site visit. So institutions and programs may be able to look really good on paper. Take, for instance, the example of an institution that has an advisory board in place. They survey the field regularly. They have an assessment system on paper that looks very robust, includes stakeholders in the conversation, those kinds of things. But at the site visit, the team begins hearing that no one ever attends these, these advisory board meetings. They aren't held regularly. Um, communication may be one way. It's the institution talking to the TK12 um, institution rather than um, a, a, a two-way conversation. Um, the data is not used, those kinds of things. Um, and so you get a different sense once you're there. On the other hand, an institution may do sort of a poor job of, of demonstrating it on paper what their collaborative relationship looks like. Maybe they have no evidence of certain things. But when the team actually gets there, they're finding out that, in fact, there's widespread evidence that the institution seeks input, that responds quickly to the needs of the field. Um, they respect and honor the input of their stakeholders. So it is really a tricky area in which the team is trying to understand from an outsider's perspective what is going on at the institution. Um, I wanted to mention that we are able to see, and we tried to highlight it here, in looking back at some of our accreditation findings for the last five years, what we know is that the accreditation teams have been able to identify when a collaboration is not occurring or not occurring very well um, between an ed prep program and the TK-12 partners. On page 10, we talk about these findings. We looked at from 2015 to 2019, 20, the last year, uh, to see where issues of concern may have arisen by site visit team members. And of the majority of the institutions, there were 36 institutions during that time period that had stipulations. And of those, about 58%, the majority, had one or more findings related to collaboration with its educational partners, either in the design, operation, or data collection or feedback for those partners. So in looking at the data of the more recent two-year period, we did see that about 26% had a common standards finding related to collaboration. So what we know basically is that teams do generally seem to be, be able to identify when there is something lacking. Um, it's harder, though, the cases where collaboration does seem to exist. It is harder and important to note that, again, as an outsider looking in with a limited snapshot of time um, to determine whether the evidence they're seeing is an indication of an authentic, meaningful, purposeful, driven, collaborative partnership when there is um, evidence. As I said earlier, there are numerous examples of good collaboration taking place in California. Um, we highlight just a few examples in the item. 
Um, sometimes these are on an overarching or big picture scale. We included the example of LA Unified School District and their residency work. And they have been telling us that that residency work has really contributed to a much deeper relationship with their partners and their stakeholders, meeting more regularly, having richer conversations, working better on behalf of their candidates and students. And the residency model in particular seems to be well suited for these really strong collaborations. Um, we do have an item in December coming uh, up on the residency uh, grants, and so we, you could dig a little bit deeper on that, partic that particular pathway type um, in December as well. Um, more often, though, what we see is evidence on a, uh, on a sort of a smaller scale. So maybe that we have a, we've highlighted an example um, at CSU Long Beach where in their urban dual credential program, candidates that are earning both the multiple subject and a special ed program, they actually attend classes at the TK-12 schools. They do that. Um, it has been a really successful model. Everyone seems to be extremely happy with it. And for many, many years, Long Beach, uh, California State University Long Beach has been kind of held up as a model of good collaboration with this local school district. So this seems to be another um, example of that. Um, and then there, there are really numerous, numerous examples of, um, you know, institutions working on smaller scale projects, you know, reading labs. Um, we talk about Chapman and Loyola both had reading labs and that many institutions have reading labs. The inclusion of community partners in a mock IEP we saw at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Sac State has been really involved in the Educator Retention Network, which is a regional um, effort. So there are lots and lots of those kinds of examples. Um, before I wrap up on the focus on accreditation, we wanted to mention um, talking a little bit more about the IDP and the Individual Development Plan. Um, it needs to be said that originally with our focus on strengthening and streamlining the accreditation project, which w was something that we did from 2014 to 2016, the IDP was in the standards, but we did not explicitly ask for it as part of the program review documentation. Um, it was a new requirement. It, we began hearing that it wasn't happening, um, and so we tried to do technical assistance. We put out a PSA. Um, we did those kinds of things, and finally, uh, you know, a couple years into it, we have continued to hear that there is some um, um, issues with uh, an induction program not getting these IDPs. Um, this year, we did make the change, so any institution submitting their program review for this year will have to include a template of their IDPs. Um, we have worked with the teams to make sure that they're asking for what does it look like, what do you do, how are those conversations going. Um, we are beginning to hear, um, this is a good thing, we are beginning to hear in some of these cluster meetings for this fall that institution or induction programs are beginning to get those IDPs. So we think that there has been an uptick, um, but we will continue to uh, work hard to make sure that the word is out that we will be looking for those uh, as well. And then in the agenda item, I also uh, we also felt it was really important to mention the CSU New Generation of Educators project. Um, which had as part of its core goal to foster those deep partnerships between campuses and districts. And they looked at 11 of their campuses and the districts they serve. A link to that reflections document is in there. I am not an expert on that project, but um, it has some really interesting reflections, including you know, the need for joint goals, as well as co-ownership of programs. Um, and then lastly, of course, the letter that um, was, was released yesterday from the three agencies is, is perfectly aligned with this, um, this agenda item. So given the importance of collaboration and ensuring an effective and responsive educator preparation programs, the Commission may want to think about whether the current language of the standards is sufficient or whether there are concepts or other things that you would like to include. Um, that you would like us to think about um, and bring you back a, another item in the future or an aspect of this we'd like to dig a little bit deeper, but we're looking forward to your conversation and we're happy to um, answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan and, and Ms. Hickey. This is very interesting and, and um, appreciate your time. We will now open for public comment. I'd like to remind members of the public that wish to speak on a specific item to please email your request to comments at ctc.ca.gov or call 916-322-6253. Recording Secretary, are there any public comments? Yes, we have four submitted so far. The first is uh, Brian Johnson. Great, thank you. Mr. Johnson. 
Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, commission staff. My name is Brian Johnson. I am the director of certificated workforce management for the Los Angeles Unified School District. And among my responsibilities, I am charged with the teacher recruitment operation for our district. Um, I wanna to say today that collaboration with our local educator preparation programs is perhaps the most crucial component of our work. This agenda item includes a description of our district's collaborative relationship with our institution of higher education partners as part of our teacher residency programs. Now these teacher residency programs are very important, but they do represent only a limited portion of our annual hiring needs, especially for a district of our size. These strong continuing relationships between local education agencies and institutions of higher education across a variety of program offerings, including residency, traditional pre teacher prep programs and internship preparation routes are absolutely vital to the ability of our district or any district to meet our new hire needs. Some of the ways in which we continue to engage with our local IHEs include not only our work with the residencies, including our participation in the California Teacher Residency Lab and the Southern California Residency Action Network, but collaboration on a number of different levels as well. We have a data sharing agreement among a number of our local IHEs and we're working together to engage our own students in LA Unified to encourage the pursuit of careers in education. We also engage in critical thought partnerships around increasing the diversity of our workforce, as well as devising strategies for sustaining the efforts of our joint grant funded programs once those grants have said, sunsetted. These are all examples of really strong collaborative work that LA Unified is doing with several of our local institution of higher education uh, partners. Now we're grateful for the exceptionally strong relationships that we've been able to build with our IHE partners. And we are equally grateful today to the commissioners and to commission staff for assembling this report and highlighting the importance of these relationships in our collective work of meeting the needs of the students and families of the state of California. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Our next um, public comment. Patricia Pernan, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Patricia Pernan and I am the administrative coordinator of the Los Angeles Unified School District's Intern Credentialing and Added Authorization Program, or as we call it, ICAP. This agenda item is particularly relevant to the collaboration from the program side, in which we are engaging with the LEAs and IHEs around and surrounding the Los Angeles area. One of my assignments is to maintain the regional network meetings. During our bi-monthly regional network meetings, representatives from the county office, local districts, and surrounding colleges and universities credentialing programs meet. We discuss program changes and outcomes, share best practices on implementation of program requirements, and receive every single time an update from the needs of LAUSD recruitment. This collaboration has become particularly important during COVID-19 as all programs are experiencing similar pro challenges. The time spent together has provided all of the LEAs and IHEs an opportunity to problem solve. Being able to provide real-time collaboration has afforded us to work together to determine how we will meet the needs of all of our participating teachers, many of whom serve LAUSD schools. Our group understands that there are numerous pathways for candidates that include undergraduate programs, intern programs, residency programs, as well as traditional graduate programs with student teaching. However, we do know that there is one constant and that constant is the implementation of program standards and TPEs. Sharing and collaborating is key to all of our work and having the support of the commission and staff is crucial. We are very appreciative when the staff joins us at these meetings. I would like to thank the commission and staff for the ongoing meetings, for the preliminary programs and the induction programs where we are able to meet with the staff. Collaboration is so important in our work and during the most trying time, I see how working together, we can truly meet the needs of all students taught by all of our teachers in all of our programs. Thank you again for your support. Thank you for your comment. Next is Danette Brown. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Hi, Danette Brown, and I'm a teacher in La Habra, California, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the California Teachers Association. I have to say, it's so good to see all your squares. Um, so I have to start to uh, additionally to giving a shout out to Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Hickey because we really appreciate this agenda item. 
it was so thoughtful and informative and we really appreciate the ongoing conversation around this topic. Um, the California Teachers Association believes relationships matter. We also believe that through collaboration, great things happen. Um, so we definitely support the ongoing focus to those concepts. Um, I would like to also um, elaborate on a point that Ms. Hickey brought up about, um, you know, that there are many ways to collaborate and many people to include in the conversation. So having said that, talk to the teachers union, include them in these conversations and relationships, because if you really want to be able to inform the new educators work, many times the union understands that context in a different way than some other people. So give them a call. Um, also, we appreciate the emphasis on and the continued uh, attention and support to the individual development plan. We believe that that is a real key element to ensure that um, induction is not a repeat of something maybe you did in your preparation program, but really helps new educators move along that um, continuum of practice. So we were excited to see that. Additionally, another thing that we were excited about was on page 15. And on page 15 under where it says initial program preconditions, um, in the parentheses it says that it's currently under revision and that a future agenda item will be brought to the commission soon. So in seeing that, I want to reiterate a comment that we have shared at previous meetings regarding um, precondition number one, the demonstration of need. Uh, we have stated before that we think just having a letter from an LEA expressing interest may not, may not really adequately address demonstration of need. We feel like that's kind of a low bar to set and we would really enjoy some more conversation and thought about that because we believe that demonstration of need also is really connected to standard five, the program impact. Because I think we need to understand too how this new program will impact existing programs in the same geographic area, in um, the subject area. All of those things need to be considered before um, you know, saying, okay, let's start a new program because we all understand that just having more programs doesn't really increase the quality of programs. So thank you again for your consideration of this item. Thank you to the staff for their amazing work and be safe. Great. Thank you. Thank you yeah. And I think we have one more public comment. Yes, Sarah Lillis, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Good morning, I'm Sarah Lillis. I'm the Executive Director for Teach Plus California. Um, first, we just wanna thank you for this item, for the really thoughtful analysis in the written agenda. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the, to the conversation that, that to come. I think our, our teaching policy fellows have been very um, concerned or, or interested or recognizing the importance of this partnership between LEAs and the prep programs, both for pre-service and for induction. And I think that, uh, uh, the staff raised some really interesting questions and important clarifications because I think we have reasonable standards and I think the focus on, on collaboration and partnership has, is very clear, but what we continue to see is the lack of clarity on the how, right? And so I think whether it is in updating the standards themselves or in providing um, clear guidance, encouragement <laughs> requirements. Um, I think that, that a lot of locals and, and educator prep programs need help on thinking through the how and how do you demonstrate that collaboration? And I think the folks from LUSD have raised a number of, of um, factors to consider. One that I think that is really um, critical is around data sharing, right? So if we're gonna be assessing the impact of this collaboration, how do we do that? And, and thinking through what that might look like. Um, I also wanted to reinforce um, the focus on the, on the um, individual development plans. We're thrilled to see that it's now part of program review. Our fellows uh, two years ago did some research. They interviewed uh, induction leads in around 20 programs and um, looking at, at their alignment with the standards. And it was consistently, that was the place where the vast majority of them said it was, wasn't happening. So we're, we're hopeful that this new requirement will make it more consistent, but I don't know, looking again at the letter that came out yesterday, if there are other strategies, I'm not quite sure what the, what the barrier has been historically. Is it just that they're not coming out of the prep programs or is there, are there other um, things that are getting in the way of the alignment of the IDP with the induction program. And so um, look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much for this, this really important, important work that you all are doing. 
Great, thank you for your comments. Recording secretary, are there any other public comments? No, we do not have any additional comments. Great, thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, the public comment period then um, is now closed for this item. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions or comments on this item? This is um, an information only item and certainly um, based on the comments we heard and COVID, the connection and collaboration between higher ed and LEAs are more important than ever. And uh, it's a good opportunity for you guys to uh, just kind of brainstorm some ideas or um, think about if there's other things you wanna learn about how to generate authentic collaboration. If anybody wants to be able to speak to the new gen teacher program at um, CSU with the recommendations that might be helpful as well. So um, I will look for questions and um, either virtually or uh, through the screen. Okay, um, Commissioner Grenner Shire. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Hickey for this really comprehensive and informative update on collaboration. And I appreciate the shout out to the CSU and the many programs um, that demonstrate the deep collaboration between our universities and our district partners. Um, the New Generation of Educators Initiative, I just wanna um, highlight that Wested will be disseminating four evaluation reports in the next couple of weeks that I will share with the commission that highlight the lessons that were learned that I think will be informative as we move forward um, with this work. I also, um, the, this report emphasizes how critical collaboration is to ensure that we prepare and retain the, the highest quality educators for our schools. And I just wanted to uh, make a, a, a plea to my fellow commissioners that this is really important right now as our educator preparation programs are uh, working with their district partners to find appropriate placements during um, this pandemic. And so I hope as a commission that we keep a, a close eye on this cohort of students um, that is going through our programs to ensure that any, um, any uh, to ensure that, that if we need to mitigate any impact on their learning that, that we can do that and that we support our uh, EPPs to do that. So again, thank you so much for this report. Right, thank you for the comments. Commissioner Simmons. I just wanna echo how well written and understandable this report is. Uh, I do have one question though. At, at the induction level, the ILP is very specific at the, so that there's collaboration actually at the candidate level, not just at the program level. Is there anything in the preliminary program that is um, similar to that? No, I think there is, oh, Aaron want, <laughs> helps to be in the same room. I see Aaron reaching for it. Um, I think I think you hit on something that uh, I know at least Karen Sacramento, who is our induction expert, has has mentioned to me at least a couple of times is that there seems to be a little bit of a not a disconnect, but there is it's much broader in the preliminary standards than it is in the in the induction standards. So, you know, if we were to put the two next to each other, you kind of and you don't know you can't see how one leads into the other one necessarily, but yeah. So I think you've hit on something. It's not explicit, but we try to, um, you know, make it clear as we do technical assistance and that kind of thing, that there is a, there is a requirement for preliminary programs to provide these documents and that is supposed to go with the candidate over to the induction program. It's not as clear as it probably could be. Um, Ms. Sullivan, did you want to add anything? Okay, um, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Klatt. Thank you. Um, and I wanna echo some of the comments about the importance of this item and thanks to the staff for putting it together so well. Um, I think the relationship between teachers who are preparing and teachers who are in induction, their relationship with their supervising teacher or mentor is so important. And so I, I'm, I'm very glad to, to see the item. Um, one question that I, I, for me is always a sticking point in these relationships though, 
um, is scheduling and availability, like the kind of just the logistics of it. And there's language um, about collaboration, about the qualifications of the supervising teacher or the induction mentor. But I feel like the, the, the discussion about the availability of, of the two partners in that relationship is often, I, I don't hear it. And I think it's, it's very challenging um, for, for in a lot of these situations, these, these two people, the candidate and, the, men, and the, the supervising teacher might not have the same prep period, might not even have the same lunch period, might have you know, schedules that really conflict. And um, you know, I'm, I don't know if this is the right place to bring that up, um, but I think without that, you know, that availability within their schedules to actually meet, the whole thing breaks down. And um, I'd like to see, I don't know if that's something that can be demonstrated as evidence, but here's the teacher's schedule, here's the candidate's schedule. Do they actually line up in a way that logistically will allow them to meet, you know, before 6 a.m. or not to before 6 a.m. or after 9 p.m.? Like where in the day does it actually, does it actually happen? So, but, but other, I'm just, other than that, I'm really, um, like I said, glad to see this item and this discussion. So thank you staff for putting the item together so, so clearly. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Um, yeah, Chair Sloan. Sorry, I too have too many windows open here. Um, this is a, a really well-written item and it's making me think about um, what Rigel Massaro said in the very beginning about her appreciation with working with staff because they are so smart. And um, uh, Cheryl and Aaron have been doing this work for a long time and it, it, it comes out clearly in, a, in this kind of a report. So three things are striking me uh, about what they have laid before us. Um, one is meaningful collaboration. Uh, a second one is communicating the importance. And a third one is learning from examples. So I'm just gonna speak to those uh, in order. With regards to meaningful collaboration, I'm hearing um, the importance of meaningful collaboration, but meaningful for what uh, it, it comes to mind? Because what I'm seeing in our standards uh, language and in the statutes is that these collaborations are important for what program sponsors need to do to prepare teachers. That's sort of what comes through in the standards language. I'm not seeing language that states that these collaborations must be important for what K, uh, P12 schools do, or, um, or that there isn't language that if we're talking about a collaboration, um, what are the mutual benefits of this collaboration? I'm not seeing that maybe necessarily in the language. Um, and for a collaboration to be meaningful, I think there has to be mutual benefits. And I have to think, I think we have to be really clear about what we, um, meaningful for what? Um, the second thing regarding communicating the importance. Um, again, um, how do we share uh, the evidence of the importance and what's important and what's important for what? And what's important for preparing educators? What's important for retaining educators? What's important for supporting P-12 students in schools where we have beginning teachers and universities uh, working closely with uh, P-12? So uh, it really, uh, I think, also requires defining these different types of collaborations, like the examples that you provided in this item. And one of the key foci that you also point out is that um, one of the really key areas of collaboration between programs in K-12 is the clinical practice. I mean, that is the focus of a lot of our work, uh, of key work in preparing our teachers. And we have a lot of evidence now for why it's important. And we have uh, uh, studies now that are showing um, that 
effective teachers to make more effective mentor teachers for new teachers. That we have evidence that when we are preparing teachers in schools where we don't have high teacher turnover, that the new teachers stay in the field longer as well. We have evidence for um, districts with strong uh, ongoing professional development and um, hiring practices and, and criteria that um, are are beating the odds, so to, so to speak, for their students. So we have a lot of evidence for what makes high quality clinical practice, I think. And um, so communicating that importance and then really thinking about our standards language around collaboration for what, for clinical practice that's mutually beneficial perhaps. Final thing I was going to talk about was learning from these examples. Um, it really struck me as something that I have, uh, Executive Director Mary Sandy and I have been talking about for a while now is how do we learn from our work? How do we in our practice as a commission help others learn from our work? How does our accreditation system become more than just an accountability system? How does it actually support program improvement and learning in programs. And what you provided here is an example to me of how we do this. All of this accreditation information that's coming into the commission that only some people see, um, you all mind that and you mind it for examples of different kinds of collaborations. And it is in those examples, as one of um, our stakeholders said, Sarah Lillis um, asked, you know, how do we do these things? And these are the examples that are there. And I'm wondering if we can have a more regularized process by which we flag, you know, in this, this one year period, here were some things that we saw. And then if we had a venue, Cal Council is a venue. That's the California Council on Teacher Educators. They have uh, two conferences every year. Is there a way that programs who are doing particular things can share that practice? And I also think it's really important not just to say, hey, here's what we're doing, but ask programs to really share the resources they use, the MOUs they design, the processes that they engage in. Uh, give us, you know, share with us the, the specific artifacts that you're using so that all programs can start developing these things. So anyway, as you can see, um, this was um, uh, uh, an item that I really uh, appreciate it. I think it's so important. And um, uh, everybody's comments here uh, to speak to that. So thank you for bringing it forward. And I look forward to continuing to talk about it. Thank you, Chair Sloan. Um, other comments? This is information only. Comments or questions? Um, it does sound like um, some kind of guidance document on how you create authentic relationships would be really nice. Um, all right, then I am going to close out um, this item. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Hickey. I wanna join everyone in thanking you for the thoroughness by which you applied um, your understanding around authentic collaboration to these standards and, and accreditation. So thank you very much. Thank it you. was our pleasure. Thank you. So uh, the big question is, would you guys just like to power through when we get to our last item under educator preparation? It is now 12-12. Uh, um, after this, we move into closed session. So just want to do a quick check-in and um, just kind of give me a thumbs up if it's okay that we just power through and get to 2D. All right. I like it. We're a very driven group here. All right. So we're going to move on to 2D. Uh, 2D is an update on the local solutions to the shortage of special educator education teachers grants program. This item is being presented by Cara Mendoza. This is an information item. Ms. Ms. Mendoza, will you please begin? Yes, thank you so much. Good afternoon, commission members. Welcome to our new student liaison, Jones. I'm so pleased today to present uh, the initial report of the local solutions to the shortage of special education teachers grant programs report. As you may recall, funding for the local solution grants was included in the 2018-19 state budget to address the recruitment, preparation, support, and retention of new special education teachers. Authorizing legislation 
provided $50 million to be awarded to eligible local education agencies who submitted a successful grant proposal outlining locally identified solutions to address the local need for credentialed special education teachers. 41 LEAs were funded, local education agencies, LEAs were funded, and I, today I share with you the results of the first 18 months of program implementation. The list of LEAs you can find and their funding amounts you can find um, in the um, appendix that is linked in the April 2019 agenda item there in the, in the current item. Because of the timing of the request for proposals and when the funds were disseminated, and that was in January 2019, it was determined that year one would actually span 18 months. All grantees were provided the option to update their year one budgets to reflect spending from January 19, 2019 through June 30th of 2020. As a reminder, though funding is disseminated on a yearly basis, funds may be expended through the grant period, which is through June 30th of 2020. The data shared today is reflective of local solutions programs for the last 18 months. And this data was due just uh, June 30th, 2020. On page two of the agenda item, one will see the requested data as outlined in the original RFP. It's important to note that though all grantees assured that they would gather the required data, participants in the local solutions programs are not necessarily required to provide demographic information. As with all forms or surveys that ask for our own demographic information, there's always an option to decline to state or when providing the informa information can simply, simply leave the information blank. All of this is said to foreshadow that though local solutions funding support, supported a large number of educators throughout the state, the demographic information for those participants is not as complete as anticipated or as hoped because the individual participant may or may not have chosen to provide that information. So what does the data say? From January 2019 through June 30, 2020, 3,658 unique individuals participated in one or more of the local solutions activities noted in the chart on page three. Some of the individuals participated in one or more of the local solutions. And in light of this, the funding, which was just over 10 million for the first year, supported 4,661 participants. And again, several of those folks may have participated in more than one activity. Included in the table on page three is information about which local solutions activities most participants engaged in and the amount of funding expended on each activity um, across the programs. Most programs reported expending a large amount of grant funds uh, of, in recruitment efforts, tuition assistance, and the like. But beyond monetary incentives that were allowable in this program, expenditures were also robust in the areas of professional development, um, including support for induction, professional learning communities, and the preparation of mentor master teachers. Of the 3,658 unique participants, there's only demographic data relative to race and ethnicity for 1,787 participants. Of those participants, 53 identified, self-identified as white, 17 as multiracial, 35% as Hispanic or Latinx, and 28% declined to state. For demographic data relative to gender, of 1,766 individuals provided this information. Of those individuals, 13% 13 self, 13 self-identified as male, 66% as female, and 19% declined to state. Relative to sexual orientation, 33% of the 1,480 individuals who provided information self-identified as heterosexual, 1% as gay or lesbian, 0.4% as bisexual, 5% self-identified as not sure, and 60% 60 60 declined to state. Beyond demographic data, grantees were asked to provide narrative responses to a myriad of open-ended questions. Though it is early in the grant funding period, grantees were asked about early indicators of the effectiveness of the local solutions grant programs. The narratives included information about the potential of lessening of special education turnover rate, and a teacher turnover rate, and the rates of teachers uh, serving on interns or waivers. 
or uh, intern credentials, permits, or waivers. Any sorts of early promising program practices coming to the forefront? Uh, any sorts of factors that hindered implementation? And of course, of the all famous lessons learned. Uh, page six begins a synopsis of the uh, responses to some of those questions. As I stated, it is early in the program, um, but grantees are reporting a positive move toward lessening the turnover rate and for decreasing the number of teachers serving on intern credentials and or permits other than a preliminary or clear, clear credential. Nearly all programs indicated a decrease in, in these um, teachers, even ever, if ever so slight. All programs were hopeful that the local solutions funds would make a difference over time. And we'll be, uh, there are three more years of the program and so we will be charting that. In the area of promising practices, many programs identified that the direct monetary support of participants, such as signing bonuses, tuition payment and such, is a practice that was generally supported only through the grace of these grant funds. This is not a practice that generally our local education agencies can do on their own. Beyond the direct monetary support, many programs shared successes with developing new professional programs for the education specialist credential holders and teachers and um, the ever popular and very important um, increase in the mentor master teachers to be provided to, the, to our um, new hires. With all new programs, there can be some challenges. Local solutions programs are not alone in that. And in the last year, of course, the programs have the bonus of managing their new grant program in the area of this, uh, in the era of this pandemic. Programs reported that um, COVID hindered activities, especially professional development gatherings and recruitment activities. Um, but beyond this, uh, beyond COVID, uh, some geographically remote programs uh, reported that they're still challenged with finding teachers for their rural areas. Um, and that the juxtaposition of knowing that mentor master teachers are very important to uh, new teachers and their progress as a teacher um, and finding those qualified individuals to be me mentor master teachers is sometimes very challenging. Each program had one or more lessons learned, many of which made the connection between uh, the proposed use of grant funds and the reality of the work. Maybe sometimes when we write grant proposals, we might dream too big. Uh, there's nothing wrong with dreaming too big. And uh, you know, there's sometimes there's some challenges in the reality of the world. Aside from this, there's an overwhelming, there was an overwhelming sense of gratitude. Um, from our program leaders, whether they're e they emailed me and saying, oh my gosh, these funds were amazing and so helpful and or if they actually put in the narrative of the of the report itself, um, it's clear that um, the LEAs are very appreciative of the grant funds and are, are believing that they that they will be effective for their local education agency as time goes on. It was, it was really encouraging to hear such gratitude. For next steps, the staff will continue to provide techni technical assistance. Uh, this morning, you met the newest addition, our new grants consultant. So I'm very happy that she will be joining us and she will be supporting us and supporting our local education agencies and our grantees. Uh, staff will support programs with budget adjustments in alignment with within the grant conditions as needed. And with efforts, um, to clearly outline and explain the need for this robust um, and accurate data collected by the programs. Um, commission will receive yearly updates and the final report is due to the Department of Finance in December, 2023. So with that, I thank you for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendoza for a very thorough report. We will now open for public comment. This is my last reminder or members of the public that wish to speak on a specific item to please email your request to comments at ctc.ca.gov or call 916-322-6253 and indicate which item you want to speak to. Recording secretary, are there any public comments? Yes, we have two. The first is uh, Jacob Guthrie. Hello, Mr. Guthrie. State your name and affiliation for the record. Good morning, commissioners and commission staff. Uh, it's very good to see you all. Uh, miss being in the room with you. 
Um, my name is Jacob Guthrie, and I'm the Assistant Director of Certificated Workforce Management for the Los Angeles Unified School District. LA Unified is a proud recipient of a Local Solutions Grant from the Commission, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to comment on the Commission's report on this grant. The primary solution that we sought to implement using this grant was to offer a monetary incentive to new fully credentialed education specialists. Last year, we were able to provide incentives ranging from $12,000 to $17,000 to 43 of these teachers. This year, we have already provided the same number of incentives and expect to continue to provide incentives as we continue hiring special educators throughout the school year. Throughout the school year excuse me. This grant has allowed us to be more competitive in the very tight market for special education teachers and has helped us to reduce the number of education specialists being hired on provisional internship permits, short-term staff permits, and internship credentials. This has allowed us to hire well-prepared teacher candidates for some of our most challenging to staff positions serving our most vulnerable students. One of the most beneficial components of this grant award was the flexibility provided to grantees to design programs that meet their local needs. To this end, we were able to allocate parts of our grant award to support additional efforts to recruit and retain new special education teachers. Part of our allocation was invested in ensuring that we are able to run an additional cohort each year through our Credentialed Educators Now Teaching Special Education program, which allows general education teachers to earn an education specialist credential while continuing to teach in their own classroom. We were also able to invest in targeted advertisement, promotional materials, and recruitment technology to assist us in the recruitment of special educators. We are grateful uh, to the commission for their advocacy in putting forth this grant program and to commission staff for their diligence in preparing this report. And I would also be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Dr. Mendoza and her team for their uh, continuous responsiveness for, with all of our emails and questions and making sure that we're getting this right. Thank you all for the time. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie, and, and thank you for sharing the experience with LAU Unified. Uh, we have another public comment. Yes, Sarah Lillis. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Lillis, Executive Director for Teach Plus California. Thank you all for, for taking the time. I'm speaking on behalf of four of our policy fellows who um, last year had written legislation AB 3002, which unfortunately didn't get moved forward because of the reduced uh, legislative time. Um, but um, we're really, we spend a lot of time looking through the, the report and thank you, Dr. Mendoza. There's a, there's a um, wealth of data in there. I think for what, what the AB 3002 was a bill that was looking to um, ask for mean, uh, more robust, meaningful evaluations of all of the investments we've done recently in addressing teacher shortage so that it can help inform our strategies going forward. And so again, with this, I think I, I would, um, we would ask the commission to think about for further updates and for ultimately for the report in, in 2023, what are the questions we want to be able to answer and what is the data and or support we need to provide grantees to be able to answer those questions. And so I think, because um, I think there's a lot we can learn with so many different strategies being being utilized locally about the, the you know, the um, greatest impact on addressing uh, teacher shortages and having the most uh, well-supported and qualified teachers in the, in the, in the classroom with our students. So um, uh, we did submit a letter. I don't want, I'm trying not to repeat it because I know I'm standing between you and lunch, but um, we would just ask that you think about in particular issues around um, turnover. I think that that's a there's a huge opportunity to dig deeply into issues around turnover. Um, and um, so another area for deeper exploration is, is around the nature of the investments. So I think we heard even just from Los Angeles Unified, the, the variety of investments that they're making. Is it just about the extra money or is there something different about the programs that are being done locally that's really having the impact and what is that impact? and how do we assess it? And then we are particularly uh, interested in how these investments are removing barriers to entry into the profession and affecting the diversity of the teaching force. And so again, I think Dr. Mendoza men mentioned this, the limitations of the data, um, what, you know, what support do local um, do LEAs need to be able to have the data so that we can say, how is this 
affecting the demographic um, makeup? How is this different um, of these local teaching forces? But but we're we're, we're looking forward to to learning more from this exciting program. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Willis, for your engagement with this um, this information item. Um, recording secretary, are there any other public comments? No, there are no additional comments. Thank you so much. The public comment period for this item is now closed. This is an information item. Um, I will just add to Dr. Mendoza, it's very encouraging to see some positive early evidence. Appreciate the challenges that you lifted up in this report as well as the lessons learned. Um, with that as context and all of the information we have from Dr. Mendoza and our public comments, um, does anybody have any questions or comments or suggestions? Uh, student liaison Jones. Yes, and um, so I, first I wanted to say I really appreciate um, the this whole document. It's seeing like locally identified solutions. I feel like having solutions is just going to be the key to solving all of our things and all of our problems and um, all of our challenges. I think something that I guess I wanted to suggest was that there was there's that chart, the table one of the locally identified solutions and the number of participants per activity. I think it would be so good if we had um, some, some more data here on, um, or even some more anecdotes on how exactly those identified solutions um, may have correlated to turnover rate or correlated to recruitment, um, how much recruitment, how, um, how much did we recruit or how much did we bring in? And I'm more so like interested too in the preparing mentors and master teachers to support new special education teachers. I think that information is so important um, for us to see how does our mentorship really sustain our teachers and our incoming teachers. So um, what exactly does those programs look like? What are those good models that are happening? So other people can like get on board and start using those. Thank you. Fantastic. Other commissioners? It's just that good of a report, huh? <laughs> Commissioner Martinez, yes. um, we received a, a last minute request from the public to make comment. Would you be willing to open up the public comment? Uh, yeah, we can um, reopen the public comment right now. Thank you. We're going to bring in Janet Davis. Well, Ms. Davis, if you're on, go ahead and start when you're ready. Sorry. You have to turn on a lot of things. Um, video. This has been a great meeting. Thank you very much. Um, it was not a light agenda. Um, I, I think all the, the pieces kind of come together. The, the shortage of special ed teachers has been so frustrating. My, my apologies, Ms. Davis, but can yeah. you introduce yourself and the organization that you're with? Sorry. We just lost you. You went back to mute. There, there you go. I won't touch anything. Okay. <laughs> um, Janet Davis, representing the California Federation of Teachers. Um, this, I guess I was muted, but this was a great meeting. Thank you very much. And uh, the, the thing that, that struck me with this report is it kind of was related to all the other things you've said about collaboration. And I wonder, the, the truth that we all know is that the reason we have such a great shortage is because we lose so many special ed teachers. I mean, that's the bottom line. And I thought the, the debt relief was so obvious that's gonna you know, increase the diversity of our teachers, but it is a huge um, barrier to people continuing and becoming, uh, especially special ed teachers, because in the end, somehow they always seem to have more classes than the, than the rest of us had to take. Um, the thing that I thought was important was that I noticed there were fewer re, non reelects and I think that would sort of demonstrate that the districts are really valuing their special ed brand new teachers and 
you know, the mentor's important, the special activities to give them additional support because that's a very hard job. We, the gen ed teachers, we all know how hard those um, teachers are working and what a huge uh, amount of knowledge they have to do just to start their job. So I thought all those are important, but the thing that struck me was that districts perhaps are really valuing those, those people and giving them the support so that they will continue on. So anyway, thank you very much. I think these, these grants are uh, essential. Great. Thank you. thank you, Ms. Davis, for powering through the uh, technology challenges <laughs> um, with our Zoom meeting. So, um, Madam Secretary, I'm going to close, Recording Secretary, are there any other public comments? Nothing else has come in. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to close the public comment period again and reopen the opportunity for commissioners to ask any questions or make any comments. Um, and again, this is um, this is an information item only. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of close down the conversation. I think um, Ms. Davis actually said it really nicely about how this dovetailed with the other conversations. And, um, and so I feel like we've had a really robust morning around um, how do we support our special education teachers and students and how do we do this in a holistic and collaborative way. So Dr. Mendoza, I appreciate you ending our morning and, um, and for um, the really good report. So um, with that in mind, having no additional items today, I recess the Educator Preparation Committee until tomorrow. Chair Sloan. Thank you, Commissioner Martinez. And I appreciate you for running this. What a good job. Thank you. I will uh, now recess the general session. Members of the commission will go into closed session after we take a 30 minute lunch break. It is now 1235. Uh, so if we could reconvene and close session at 105. Um, and the general session will reconvene at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Do I leave? Yeah. Tomorrow morning?